major news. After days on the razor's edge, Ukraine is now a nation at war. Just hours ago, Russian forces began their attack. President Vladimir Putin warning other countries that any attempt to interfere with the Russian action will lead to, quote, consequences they have never seen. People in Ukraine are panicking, they're taking shelters, and people in Ukraine are definitely suffering from this, but uh, as all these sanctions being thrown on Russia, uh, people in Russia will suffer from the consequences soon. People in these two countries are suffering, but who is benefiting, benefiting from this war? Well, it's clear that, that Russia was put in a very difficult situation. And in order to understand this conflict, we have to go back a few years to understand that the United States has surrounded Russia with adversaries, with NATO members that have missiles and that want war with Russia. And the United States has refused to allow uh, Russia to have security guarantees. Russia, back in December, asked for a series of very reasonable security guarantees, and Washington and NATO said no. They refused to concede any of these security guarantees, and now Russia was forced to take action to defend its security interests. And it's very similar, actually, to what the U.S. has been doing with Taiwan, sending weapons to Taiwan, sending troops to Taiwan, trying to train separatists. I mean, it's, it's very similar. The U.S. Is, is waging a new Cold War on both Russia and China at the same time. And the U.S. is trying to take parts of China and also neighbors of Russia and turn them against China and Russia to wage war against them to destabilize these countries. And that's why Russia was forced to take action to prevent Ukraine from being this powder keg, from being a country that could potentially join NATO, which means that it could have nuclear weapons threatening the, the country of Russia. Let's not forget that it was through Ukraine that Russia has been invaded twice, including the Nazis. When, when the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union, they invaded through Ukraine. In your opinion, how important is BRICS? How, what kind of difference it can bring to the global south? Yeah, BRICS right now, it's it's maybe one of the most important uh, initiatives we have uh, politically in the whole world and economically. So as you said, I mean that right now there's the, the meetings happening. Uh, BRICS today is it's five countries. China, I mean, if you, if you take for um, from uh, GDP, PPP, which is the, the real GDP that purchase uh, uh, bears power. So China is the biggest economy in the world. India is the third. Russia is the sixth. And Brazil is the eighth. So of eight economies, uh, the four, big, four biggest, four out of eight are uh, in BRICS. By the time she touched down, tensions were ratcheting up. An American this senior on this soil is provocative. Tonight, China has launched a joint military operation around the island, including firing long-range ammunition and testing guided weapons. It is a display of military might as well as anger. The US and Taiwan have colluded to make provocations first, and China has only been compelled to act out of self-defense. In the face of the US's unscrupulous behavior in defiance of China's repeated and serious complaints, any countermeasures China is taking will be justified and necessary. The first country to ever attack Taiwan with a warship was the US in 1867. And the country that supported Japan in invading Taiwan during the Mudan incident was the United States in 1874. The country that sold weapons to Japan during the first Sino-Japanese War leading to China's defeat, forcing China to cede Taiwan to Japan, was the U.S. from 1894 to 1895. The country that actively pushes for Japanese containment of China is the United States, from the 19th century until today. So can we really say that the United States is our friend? I mean, we're being used to 
serve U.S. imperialist interests. The whole reason they're in this situation in the first place is because the U.S. Uh, sold them out to, to reestablish ties with, with the mainland. The U.S. wanted to, to use those, those new reestablished ties to reassert itself over China. When that didn't work, they went back to Taiwan as, as their last card in their hand. And, and now, you know, you see the whole process start over and they're, they're, they're right back to using Taiwan as a battering ram against the mainland. It, it's very sad. It's sad to see. And this is why they pick young people, because older people wouldn't fall for this. This is why they this is why they pick young people here in Thailand and in neighboring countries. They're the only ones that will buy into this. When in reality, if you just take a few minutes and think, you use logic and reason, you will see that it is a formula to burn your country to the ground. True independence means independence from this sort of hegemonic, unequal relationship where you don't even have dignity as a human being. And I do not think, and I think this sort of independence can only achieve through peaceful reunification with the rest of China, where we are equal citizens with equal rights, and we actually have our voices heard as equal citizens and not subjects of empire. People admire China. People are curious. People want to know about how China did this. Because we remember even if a lot of young Chinese people don't, what China was like 60 years ago, what China was like 100 years ago. But we have seen the transition, and we've seen that transition take place in a period where we have stagnated or even fallen behind. China's been moving up. Okay. So when you say to people that China is a socialist or communist country, it makes them sit up. Maybe this this communism thing is not so bad. It helps create a conversation. We are just beginning to learn the details of the process as it's obtained in China and learning what variables there are that could be used in Africa. How does this work in our part of the world? So the language is perhaps vilified. There's a certain discomfort with the terms. But China's example is changing that. At the end of the day, <clears throat> what matters is the material conditions of people. The living conditions matter. How can you come and tell the Chinese people that their system is bad today? The system that has lifted them out of poverty over a historical shortest period possible. How can you tell them to hate themselves, to hate the effort, the, the products of their own efforts? For a long time, as Comrade Dupoka said, they were trying to attribute the Chinese success to capitalism. But the Chinese leaders and the Chinese people are saying, we have developed because of socialism. That's what President Xi Jinping is telling the world, is telling us. That's what we are learning from them. I recognize that. Given the situation, I cannot deliver the mandate on which I was elected by the Conservative Party. I have therefore spoken to His Majesty the King to notify him that I am resigning as leader of the Conservative Party. You know, I mean, obviously Liz Truss's tenure will be seen in Britain and globally, I think, as an utter failure. And it's, as you, as you probably know, the shortest reign of any prime minister in British history, uh, just 44, 45 days. And really, it's indicative of a number of things. It's indicative of an overall crisis of British capitalism, and it's indicative of some of the very deep-rooted problems in British democracy. You know, Britain is a country that sort of projects itself as the sort of the, the country that gets to define democracy as the birthplace of democracy, uh, as a country that has a democracy that's so good, that's so powerful, that it should spread that democracy around the world and that, that it should set itself up as the judge of other countries and their systems. 
Um, but Liz Truss was elected by 170,000 members of the Conservative Party. It's not a very democratic mandate for a country like Britain with 67 million people in it. You're talking about 0.2% of the population. I mean, we can compare it with the National Congress of the CPC, which is now taking place, where leaders are chosen by elected, re elected representatives of a party that's got 96 million members, which is over 500 times as many members as the Conservative Party. And, you know, who are these 170,000 people that got to vote for Liz Truss as Prime Minister? They are wealthy people, older people, and almost exclusively white people. And by no means is that kind of an accurate reflection of modern Britain, of the British population, and certainly not of the working class and ordinary people. You know, Liz Truss has continued this trajectory of outsourcing Britain's foreign policy to Washington, and it's had devastating consequences. And, you know, and people are angry, and she's had to stand down after just 44 days. A reminder of our headlines this hour, former president and leftist leader Lula da Silva has been declared the winner of a knife-edge presidential runoff election. With over 99% of ballots counted, he has taken 50.9% of the vote. Incumbent Jair Bolsonaro took 49.1%. Supporters of Lula da Silva are in the streets celebrating an extraordinary comeback for the man who previously served two terms as president. I know you guys are big supporters for Lula. You guys are both from the left. So I'm just wondering why you support Lula so much. What does Lula's win mean for Brazil and Latin America? O, o Lula vai encontrar um grande desafio. É, além de encontrar um país dividido, ele tem grandes tarefas pela frente. Ele vai precisar reposicionar o Brasil no cenário global, ele vai precisar enfrentar a fome de 30 milhões de brasileiros, que é talvez a principal tarefa dele, ele vai ter que pacificar o país, né? ele vai ter que conviver com uma frente ampla muito diversa, porque para realizar essa primeira tarefa de vitória, ele precisou criar uma frente ampla com pessoas da esquerda, da centro-esquerda, da centro-direita e da direita democrática. Então foi um grande arranjo político, uma grande construção política, tem até uma curiosidade. O vice-presidente do, do Lula, o vice, é, foi, já foi um, um adversário político dele, que é o Geraldo Alckmin, né, que já foi governador de São Paulo por várias vezes. E a nossa expectativa é que vai, ter, vai dar muito trabalho, ele vai ter que ter muito jogo de cintura, porque a partir de fevereiro ele vai encontrar um congresso nacional extremamente conservador, com a maioria do, dos novos membros, né, dos novos parlamentares de direita e apoiadores do Bolsonaro. Mas no Brasil é um pouco complicado uma, e eu tenho uma, a gente tem muita esperança na habilidade política do Lula. Ele é um grande construtor, ele é um grande democrata, mas a gente não espera um governo puro de esquerda. A gente primeiro precisa reconstruir. It's a, it's a historical moment because, for instance, this is the first time we have the six biggest economies uh, of, the, of, the, of the region, Latin America and Caribbean, uh, run by the left. So it's Brazil, it's Mexico, Argentina, Colombia, Venezuela, and Chile. This is the six largest economies. But you also have, as you said, uh, Bolivia, Honduras, and even Cuba. So, um, and it's also the first time in history that we have, uh, Colombia has a leftist uh, president. It's the first time. And even Mexico, last time Mexico had like a leftist uh, president was like maybe in the 30s of last century. So it's really a special moment in, in Latin America. President Xi Jinping has called on the G20 to work together to meet the challenges of our times and build a better future. He said the summit comes at a time of momentous change. He said all countries should advocate peace, development and win-win cooperation. As the APEC 2022 chair, Thailand will hold the APEC CEO summit ahead of the APEC economic leaders meeting. As the first in-person CEO summit in three years since the start of the pandemic, the gathering aims to discuss solutions to the world's current and future challenges. APEC is taking place in, in Thailand this year, right now, this week. Why do you think alliances like APEC, uh, ASEAN, and all these 
Southeast Asian countries coming together is so important? Well, A ASEAN is very important for Southeast Asia because these are all immediate neighbors. And then ASEAN's immediate neighbor to the north is China. And these are countries that have uh, ties and relations and trade that stretch back generations and generations, centuries and centuries. So it seems like a very natural progression, socioeconomically and politically, all, all of these groups of people continuing to work together, trade, travel to one, one another's uh, nations, um, un increasing understanding among each other. And again, I, I have watched this region go from uh, a place that was heavily under Western influence to the waning Western imperialism that had been fading away from this region and it being replaced by actual genuine cooperation. Uh, as, as the Chinese government always says, win-win cooperation. I, I've watched it, I've watched it happen. I've watched one, one system fade and one replace it. And, and you can see the difference. This is a stark contrast. Xi Jinping arrived in Riyadh Wednesday for the first Arab-China summit for cooperation and development. He's set to leave tomorrow after meeting with leaders from the Gulf states, including Iraq and Qatar. Can you share with us your thoughts on the importance of this cooperation between China and the Arab world, and especially what kind of import, importance, what kind of influence it will bring to the world economy? Especially now we are all witnessing unprecedented changes in the world. The Arab world, as we uh, people should know, is that we it stretches from West Asia, like Iraq, is the uh, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, Jordan, and the Gulf countries. But then it crosses over to Africa, to Egypt, North Africa, Sudan, uh, and uh, we have also other countries like the Comoros in the Indian Ocean. This region is very, very important if you look at its location, geographical location. It's at the crossroads between three continents. It's also between Asia, Europe, and Africa. We have the connection between the Indian Ocean, the Red Sea, the Mediterranean. So this is a very one of the most important knots in the, in the global trade and uh, connectivity uh, uh, network, which the Belt and Road Initiative is rebuilding with modern means. The, the Arab countries are home to almost more than two-thirds of the oil and gas reserves in the world. It has a massive financial reserve, but also a very, very young population with great aspirations and uh, demands for development. So it's a perfect match to have China, which has developed in such a, a fast fashion to a modern prosperous nation, and the Arab nations who have similar aspirations that the two can match each other and work together and the visit by President Xi Jinping is going to be a massive event in the history of this region because this is happening, as you said, in a time of massive change in the world where the world economic pivot is moving to the east with China, East Asia, ASEAN countries and uh, we have the old geopolitical systems really not functioning. It's threatening with wars, regional wars, but probably as in the case of Ukraine, could we, have, we could have a world war emerging out of that. So therefore, there is a very clear indication for these Arab countries where the future lies. And that is in the East, but also the Arab nations can become a bridge between East and West. So we don't have a divided world once more, but that should this, uh, the world should unite between East and West in the Arab world around principles of economic cooperation and win-win. Uh, as President Xi Jinping phrases it, you know, uh, to build a future uh, community for uh, the future of the humankind. What's up, everybody? 
What's up? Welcome to Talk It Out with me, Li Jingjing, live from Beijing. This show aims to show you the different voices and, and stories that are often neglected by the Western mainstream media. And we dedicate it to show all the voices and stories from the global south. And you know what? As 2022 comes to an end, I decided to this uh, year and a special and also the very first live stream on my channel. And we try to figure out uh, where the world is heading in 2023 and also try to review all these major geopolitical events in 2022. 2022 is truly another unusual year. We are three years into the pandemic. Conflicts and tensions are still raging through the world. And we are all in the middle of a global recession. But amid all this chaos, we are also seeing geopolitical shifts almost taking place in every continent. And uh, in the past year, I counted, I almost did 50 different videos, uh, in-depth interviews featuring guests from around the world, from Latin America to Africa to Asia, to discuss all these pressing issues facing us in this world. And I received a lot of support from you guys, uh, all my viewers from around the world. I have been reading all your comments, all your reviews under each of my video, under each of my posts on, on all platforms, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, TikTok. So I truly appreciate your support. And so I decided to try something new, starting with the live stream now, and I will continue to do more live streams in 2023. So uh, do stay tuned with my channel. And today, in this year in a special, I invited several of those popular guests back to this show to review all these major geopolitical events in 2022 and uh, look into 2023. So if you like this live stream, remember to hit the like button uh, and leave a comment because this will help this live stream, this video be promoted by the algorithm of YouTube. You know, voices like mine and my guests are often being uh, censored, uh, neglected, and shadow banned by these platforms. So it's very crucial, it's very important that you interact with our live stream, interact with our, our videos. And I have a laptop right in front of me, and I've been watching your live chats uh, during live stream. So just while we were playing the video that you just saw, it was uh, uh, all the highlights from all my guests that I, I have talked to in the past year. And I hope you'll like it. And I've, I've been seeing some of the comments in this live chat. Uh, Huang Tua, is that how to pronounce your name? Uh, you're very active in this live chat, thank you. And also I saw Jackson Wong and um, Kevin, James Ng. I know you've been supporting me on several platforms, so thank you so much. Uh, do leave your comments, your thought, and also Raphael, I'm sorry, Raphael, and in the live chat section, thank you so much for watching this live stream. And uh, if you have any questions, if you have any comments about this live stream, about the views that shared by my guests, let us know. We will try to read your comments and try to answer your questions during this live stream. So uh, let's meet our guest today, shall we? Uh, my first guest today, uh, has been very popular on this channel. Several people have been calling uh, him to come back to the show. And uh, his name is Hossein Eskri. Hi, Hossein. <laughs> Hi, Jing Jing. Thank you very much. And uh, congratulations for a wonderful and successful year you have had uh, with your show. Uh, you are very popular now around the world. <laughs> oh, I <have> really? <laughs> world. So that's, uh, that's great. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I probably I would do a little bit brief introduction about Hossein Eskri uh, for those new viewers to my channel uh, because uh, we I've talked to Hossein several times this year. Uh, we debunked all the lies that is the smear campaign created by several Western companies to defame the Belt and Road initiatives. And also recently in December, we've made a, this video uh, discuss the very first historical China's Arab State Summit. And so Hossein Eskri is the vice chairman 
for the Belt and Road Institute in Sweden and also the West Asia Coordinator for the Shooter Institute in Sweden. Uh, he has thorough knowledge and uh, he did thorough research into the Belt and Road Initiative. So how about we talk about BRI first, Jose? Okay, well, uh, our job and our you know, mission is to become a bridge between the East and West. Uh, we are not intending to, to, to play with the idea of splitting the world. We are trying to connect the world between East and West. Uh, what President Xi Jinping calls a community for a shared future for humankind is a real potential. Uh, but the world is fraught with problems, misunderstandings, and the year 2023 is going to be the year of the Belt and Road Initiative because it will be the 10th anniversary mm -hmm. since President Xi Jinping announced the BRI in September 20, uh, 2013. So we're going to have a lot of activities, and I'm very happy that now the restrictions in China are lifted so we could have uh, more interaction with our Chinese friends coming over here to Europe or we going to others uh, also going to China to highlight this important uh, event. Mm. So the Belt and Road Initiative has gained enormous uh, 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 momentum in 2022. Uh, now 149 nations uh, have joined lately. Uh, it was Argentina. And uh, this has, despite all the disinformation, the, uh, the smear campaigns and things, uh, you know, negative uh, propaganda against the Belt and Road and China, more and more nations are finding the Belt and Road Initiative as a fantastic vehicle for uh, cooperation, for economic development, for promoting trade and cultural. Uh, let's not forget that the part of the Belt and Road Initiative is people-to-people -people communication, which is very crucial today because we, the world today is so fraught with uh, geopolitical problems, misunderstandings, negative propaganda that people's view of other nations, people's view of other peoples is being affected by this. And I hope that opening up after the COVID-19 uh, pandemic episode, it will help people to have a better understanding of other peoples, people in the West seeing the East and East and West. So we have, for example, this horrible situation in Ukraine. Uh, which has affected the whole world with, with the energy, fertilizer, food crisis. But also, uh, it's, uh, you know, Ukraine itself is suffering, but also the whole of Europe is suffering. And President Xi Jinping and China have presented the idea that Ukraine, instead of being a hand grenade, you know, uh, which will hurt itself, and others, it should become a bridge between East and West, between Russia and Western Europe, between Asia and Europe. And this is the kind of ideas that we really need to promote in this coming year uh, and to uh, surpass all these horrible and negative things that we saw in 2022. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned something very important because 2023 will be the 10th anniversary of the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative. Do you feel optimistic about the future of BRI? Because now it's facing this tremendous smear campaigns from are almost on every continent. So do you still feel optimistic? I'm very optimistic because what I look at is reality. I don't look at the propaganda. Uh, and we know that the source of the propaganda is not that people around the world uh, had come up with these things. I mean, there's a very clear campaign financed and pushed and organized by people inside intelligence services in the United States and in certain countries in Europe and Britain uh, using certain think tanks, so-called academic institutions and personalities to push through narratives that have nothing to do with reality. And this is what, the, what is fascinating because what people see on the media is contrary to what is happening in reality. As I said, the more smear campaigns are launched against the Belt and Road, the more nations joined it. That's paradoxical, isn't it? And what nations look at is not what the media in the West or some think tanks say about China and the Belt and Road. They look at the reality of how China has developed, how China is working with other nations on the Belt and Road uh, group of nations, all the infrastructure which is being built to promote the productivity and prosperity of peoples, all the support China has, is, is, has given to nations with the Health Silk Road when the pandemic was launched, helping nations to produce vaccines at home almost for free. This is what nations and people look at. Uh, what 
others in the mass media and who have been actually, as we have seen uh, in other events, uh, uh, these mass media have been discredited massively on every front, on the economic situation in the world, on the financial situation, on uh, their support for uh, coups and revolutions, color, color revolutions around the world. This mass media has discredited itself. And what I'm in, think optimistic about is that people are looking more and more at reality rather than these uh, negative campaigns. We have debunked through your show on your show, we showed for the first time a very, very real case with Sri Lanka, which some people in US institutions and in Europe say we should use Sri Lanka as the template for how China is trapping nations. And we showed on your show and through our research that China has absolutely nothing to do with Sri Lanka's financial problems. China's share of Sri Lanka's debt, as we showed, is only 10% of the foreign debt. But we also showed that the ones who have, who own most of the debt of Sri Lanka are financial firms like BlackRock, Ashmore, Aberdeen, the Anglo-American financial investors who buy the debt of nations and then they claim high interest rates and conditionalities for that payment. Those are the people who own almost 50% of Sri Lanka's debt and that's where the crisis comes from. So we showed that on your show and people are seeing this around the world. It has spread all over the place and these smear campaigns will only affect a number of people who already have a, a pre-established uh, idea about Asia, China, and other countries, but these are losing their uh, place in this stage of history right now. Mm. Uh, you mentioned the economy that uh, was uh, impacted by the conflicts in Ukraine, uh, across the world. So we are seeing different countries are we should, we're seeing this enthusiasm of joining d uh, different regional organizations and also countries looking for closer ties, closer connections with their regional partners. So um, there, are, there are the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, also the BRICS, uh, which is, uh, re refers to the five countries, Brazil, Russia, uh, India, China, and South Africa. So there are several different regional organizations among them with which you think has more potential? Well, I think the, the idea of multilateralism took a very huge step forward in 2022 with the summit, which you mentioned, the BRICS summit, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization summit, and the China Arab summit, which is very, very special because it had certain indicators where things are moving and that these, uh, these kinds of uh, multilateral institutions are becoming more and more the norm because the unipolar world, which has brought to us these series of crises from the financial crisis to the wars and like recently the war in Ukraine, and with the enormous economic impact on every nation, that this unipolar world is crumbling. The problem is if we, we don't want to replace this unipolar world with a bipolar world or multipolar world, we want to replace it with what President Xi calls a uni, uh, multilateral world, where you don't reinvent the United Nations Charter, you don't reinvent all these important principles of international relations and peaceful coexistence, but it has to be based on these principles and cooperation as the main, uh, and dialogue as the main way to solve problems among nations. And these new institutions are showing the, like the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the BRICS, uh, and the China Africa Forum, the China Arab World Forum, is showing that the world is moving into a different direction. Nations want to secure their future by looking at where the future of the economic development, uh, trade, and securing the, their resources is. And that's in Asia right now. That's a reality which very few people in the West have realized or there is resistance to this idea, it does not mean that you replace the West, but that this is how the, the movement of history has happened, because there was a very clear goal set by nations like China and others to go for economic development uh, and get out of poverty and using modern technology and science and new ideas to get out of that uh, poverty trap. 
Now, this is what nations around the world are realizing, that the future is in Asia. Some people call it this century will be the Asian century with China at its core. So this is a very important shift in history, which nations are being uh, attracted to because they see that they can get real benefits from working with China and Asia, but without alienating the Western powers. What we need to, to create now, we have a, to have a dialogue where people in the West who are sitting on their high horses, it's like a person on the top of the mountain. You know, he sees everybody small down there, but does not realize that everybody down there see him as very small. And that position is no longer sustainable for people in the West, people in power, and also for the populations in the West. What we need is to a new uh, global uh, governance system based on the previous uh, principles of the United Nations Charter, but making economic cooperation, cultural dialogue as the core of this new system. And this is what, the, what China and its uh, friends uh, in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the BRICS and other, uh, and the BRI have shown that this is what works. And they are inviting the West to join hands into that uh, shared future for mankind, because it's a real Thing. It's not a slogan. Mm. Uh, you know, at, we in the most recent videos, uh, interviews between you and me is on the China Arab State Summit, and uh, because it's a hist historical moment, um, Chinese President Xi Jinping went to Saudi Arabia, met with several Arab leaders, and this is the first ever China Arab State Summit. So it, it's a new trend that the Arab world is working with China. And I think many people don't know that the history between China and the whole West Asia and North Africa, because uh, through the Asian Silk Road, um, many great things from the Arab world came to China, like uh, astronomy, medicine, and those inspired the development of those areas in China, in Asian China. And then through, through the uh, Silk Road, also Ch great things from China also spread it to the Arab world. So we have a huge, long history of connections. And now, through this new trend, we are trying to revive this Asian Silk Road, which is very important for the whole Eurasia region. So can you uh, tell our viewers who are watching this live streams uh, the importance the, of this historical China-Arab State Summit? Yeah, I mean, it, it was a, a very important breakthrough uh, in this period of time uh, where the, this whole region, which people call the Middle East, I mean, has been uh, plagued with interventions, wars, invasions, like the invasion of Iraq, the color revolutions and uh, manipulations in Libya, uh, Syria, uh, uh, even in other countries, we have had a very tense situation created by these geopolitical forces, the, what we call Anglo-American forces. Now, it was interesting in this uh, summit, in this situation, is that you had very strong allies of the United States and Britain, like Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, Bahrain, traditionally very tied to the Anglo-American uh, policies. Now they have opened a door which is, has been in the works for a, a while, to in, intensively work with China because they see that their economic future, uh, with, it, it, like not only as oil producing and gas and oil producing countries, they want to secure their markets, which are in the East, by the way, it's never in the West. Most of the oil and gas from the Gulf goes to the East, but the money used to go to the West from that uh, trade. Now these nations say, no, we cannot rely on this forever, we need to build industries. And China ha has been willing, like in Saudi Arabia, building petrochemical industries, where part of the oil is used to produce industrial materials, plastics, paints, uh, other chemicals, which have much, much higher value. And China has been willing to help these nations develop these industries. China also needs to secure its energy supplies into the next five to 10 decades. And this is kind of partnership which uh, people need. Now, if you look at what the, the details of what President Xi Jinping and the Arab leaders, especially the Gulf Cooperation Council in his speech, many people have not heard President Xi Jinping's uh, speech because there are things there he mentions. 
about what kind of cooperation will be taking place between the Gulf countries and China. It's amazing. I mean, it goes through nuclear power development, nuclear technology education, space exploration, training Arab astronauts to visit the Chinese uh, space station, working with China, Arab-China cooperation for exploration of the moon. And then there are other things which many people notice, the fact that China and the Gulf countries are going to trade oil and gas in yuan, in local currencies, in the Shanghai platform, uh, or Shanghai oil and gas platform. This is a big break with the dollar-dominated oil and gas trade in the world. This is opening a new chapter in the trade history and economic history of the world. So these are very, very bold uh, steps those nations have taken to show that this is the kind of partnership they want with the big powers. China is not only buying oil and gas and selling products to, to, to these countries. There's a genuine uh, intimate cooperation on which is the destiny of those two parties are based on that, that they are building a, a, a common future by developing the real economy, by going into science, uh, technology, and culture, because President Xi Jinping discussed cultural cooperation, opening new schools for learning Chinese language in these countries, but also learning Arabic in China. Mm -hmm. So this is the kind of world order which everybody is dreaming about after all these horrible years of uh, colonialism, wars, cold wars, hot wars, color revolutions, which have brought destruction to, the, to that region, probably more than other, any other region. And Africa probably is the exception in this situation. Mm. Very important. And uh, with this new partnership uh, comes with not just economic corporations, but also you mentioned the people-to-people -people exchanges, the cultural exchanges. You know, the number of Chinese people, Chinese students learning Arabic is it's astonishing because I heard from my Lebanese co-workers and he said some of the Chinese students here, their level of Arabic and the fluency and just the accent just awesome. So he was very surprised and he's been studying in China for like 10 years. So he's seeing this new trend of Chinese people learning the Arab culture, learning the Arabic language and looking forward to build be the bridges between China and Arab states. So give me this huge pressure, like I really need to, need to start to learn Arabic. <laughs> okay, yeah. thank you so much for um, uh, explaining, walking us through this major uh, events going on. Okay, now uh, let's, let's play a fun game. Uh, so here's what I'm gonna do. So in the next five minutes, I selected several weird takes on West Asia or China or BRI. So you have 10 seconds to come up with a comment to each of these funny takes. Okay, are you ready? Okay, <laughs> okay so let's take a look at the first one. Mm. Uganda discovers gold deposit worth 12 trillion US dollars. Mm. You have 10 seconds, Jose. Yeah, we have seen this uh, before. It happened in Afghanistan, but they left everything, all the minerals in Afghanistan and left. So this is not going to happen again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, yeah. On my way to save Uganda from terrorism. <laughs> that's their excuse, right? <laughs> For everything. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. it, it, that's it. that's a, a, a tactic which is used everywhere, but it has shown it doesn't work, really. Mm. Okay, let's take like, the second one. Dear USA, you appear to be a bit confused. Hope this helps. The first picture is your job, the second is not yours. What do you think about this picture? Yeah, well, that this is a very strong uh, reality. People in the West think that the, their problems are the problems of the world, but that the problems of the world are not their problems, uh, like uh, poverty, immigration, and other things. So this is a, a strong picture <laughs> okay thank you next one bri hussein that's your expertise so do you think the bri is a debt trap okay hussein 
your comment. Yeah, I think it's very easy to change the the uh, the uh, the sign there and say welcome to the West's IMF system. That's where the real death traps uh, are are made, and many nations are already inside the jaws of the shark. Uh, we see the huge international debt crisis, and it's not caused by China; it's caused by Western institutions. Mm -hmm. And the next one. <laughs> How dare you to put your country in the middle of all our military bases? <laughs> Jose, what's your comment? Yeah, in Iraq we have a, a, a standard joke when somebody is, you know, the the, uh, the aggressor, he goes crying to people say, he hit me on my hand with his face. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, that's all the funny takes for you. Uh, it's very enlightening to hear your analysis. And uh, people, uh, for those of you who haven't watched our my interview with Hossein before, uh, go to my channel, subscribe to my channel, and find the interviews I did with Hossein Eskri. Uh, one is debunk the uh, lies of that trap that some Western inter institutions created to defame the Belt and Road Initi Initiative. And also in December, we talk about in the why the Arab world is pivoting to China to work with China and what does it mean for the whole world. So go to take a look. And thank you so much, Hossein. Always a pleasure to have you on this show to share your views. And I'm looking forward to have you more in 2023. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to it. Okay, bye. Have a great day, Sweden. Okay, guys. Uh, so this is uh, Jose Asprey. Some of you, my uh, followers on this channel, you know him. Uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, his analysis. And you are watching the year-end special of Talk It Out with Li Jingjing. And we are live from Beijing. And uh, today I bring back several of the very popular guests that I've talked to in, the, in 2022. And in this live stream, the very first live stream on my channel, they will continue to share uh, their views uh, on the major geopolitical issues in 2022. And we will try to figure out where the world is heading in 2023. And I think I saw comments on YouTube. Uh, his name is Jackson Wong. Uh, he left a comment and said, I think we can't mix with the Western system with the Chinese one. China has its characteristic way to develop. Um, yes, I think it's very important. So even though we are criticizing some of the Western system, but doesn't mean we are trying to replace it with the Chinese one. Uh, I think it's very clear that uh, from the official language or in reality, uh, the words and their actions, China is always trying to build a multipolarity, support each country to find their own way to develop. Um, there's, we cannot use the same old ways. Just one size fits all, it doesn't work. So I think, especially nowadays, it's very important for every country, every continent, to find the best way to develop themselves uh, with their own uh, will and also what's looking for what's in the best interest for them. So thank you, Jackson Wong. And um, remember to leave comments, hit the like button of this live stream. This will help us to be promoted by the algorithm of YouTube. This will help our voices be heard by more people. So thank you for joining this live stream. And how about uh, let's bring back our next guest of today's live stream. He's also very, very popular. I did several interviews with him, and every time there were so many comments uh, calling him to come back to my channel. So today I bring him back. Uh, he is a very popular. His name is Brian Bledig. He's a geopolitical analyst based in Thailand and also the former U.S. Marine. And his YouTube channel is very, very popular, has so many followers, the new Atlas. So Brian, hi, welcome back to the show. 
Thank you for inviting me back. And it's quite an honor to be on your first live stream. And I think you're doing a, a really, really good job. It's not as it's not as easy as some people think to, to do a live stream. I know, but you've been doing live streams on your channel all the time, and you got so many views. Well, was, I'm very happy for you. And I really like your red shirt because, you know, got this New Year, <laughs> Chinese New Year <laughs> feel. So, okay, looking good. Ab absolutely, <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> Okay, so um, in the previous interviews, uh, you told our viewers uh, trying to expose how the United States was trying to destabilize whole Southeast Asia, especially they destabilized the region in order to encircle China. So, well, you know, we, we, we also discussed the, the Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan Island and how it further escalated the tensions in the region. But also in, during the G20, the leaders from China and the United States met and it looks like things are cooling down. So I'm wondering, um, do you think the tensions in this Asia Pacific region will continue to be escalated in 2023? That's absolutely. Uh, when the U.S. Uh, does something that appears reasonable, it's usually just to buy time uh, for them to reorganize and uh, try try at a different angle. The, I always point out the U.S. government's National Endowment for Democracy. That organization still exists. It's still pouring millions and millions of dollars into every single country along China's borders and, and in the region. And it's all, again, aimed at undermining governments that want to work together with China because it obviously benefits them and to put a client regime into power that will irrationally transform the country into a, a belligerent toward China at their own cost, at the cost of the entire region, including China. And that is the whole purpose. This is what the U.S. has been doing since the end of World War II, and they're going to continue doing it as long as these circles of interest hold power in Washington. Uh, this, this process will continue, and only momentary only momentary lapses of seemingly reasonable behavior only to be followed by further escalation. Mm. So what's your view on the security around the Taiwan Island? How, how, what China should be taking, well, be careful about? Because we know they will continue to use the Taiwan Island to, to stick it to China. And, uh, you know, and now they're selling weapons that are not useful to, to Taiwan Island, and also, um, they're, but they're also stealing the uh, talents and resources from Taiwan Island to the United States. So, I mean, what's the future lies in this region? Like, what's your thought? I, I, think, I think you just said it. They're emptying out everything of value in Taiwan. They're bringing it to the United States and they're pouring weapons, wh whether they're effective or not, into the, the region. And the whole reason why they would be doing this is to cr create a conflict, make sure everything of value has already been taken and is in their possession, and then just burn everything down and everyone along with it. We we've already seen them do this in a certain country in Eastern Europe. They're doing it right now. And they've been very clear about how they would like to recreate this situation in East Asia and, and do it uh, between China and its, its own territory, Taiwan, which they have been trying to pry away from China all of this time. Hmm. But, you know, like you in Thailand, living in Thailand for a pretty long time, 15 years, almost, I think. Yeah. And um, uh, over 15 years. Yes. Over 15 years. Very impressive. Yes. You saw the changes in this region. So, and also, we've seen the Southeast Asia are aligning with each other through multiple regional organizations, such as the ASEAN, APAC, and do you think uh, they will continue to, to destabilize the whole Southeast Asia, and what's the chance for the United States to win? Uh, it, it's hard to say, but yes, they are definitely trying to uh, destabilize all, all of Southeast Asia because Southeast Asia is becoming stronger collectively. Uh, they are uh, uh, an important trade partner collectively for China, and they themselves are benefiting greatly from China. They are building themselves up individually and as a region, 
the, the stronger that they, they get, the harder it is for the U.S. to exercise influence over them. And this is something that the United States for decades and decades, the, their foreign policy has been predicated on the notion of preventing or eliminating peer or near peer competitors. Uh, so they don't want to see a strong united mm -hmm. Russia, a strong united China, mm -hmm. and they most definitely don't want to see other regions getting stronger and working their way out from under the, the shadow of US privacy and hegemony. That is what's happening across the region, and China is a, a key player in making it happen. Their, their approach to foreign policy, trade, and relations with other countries is completely different than the United States. It's so much more appealing, and that's why uh, we see Southeast Asia working so closely with China. Hmm. Um, Thailand, Indonesia are, are forming a closer ties with China, especially recently with the two major uh, summit, G20 and APEC, uh, happened in 2022. Do you see uh, like more infiltrations or small groups founded by AEB trying to destabilize Thailand or Indonesia or in those countries? Well, Th Thailand specifically, yes. Like there are small, very small, but very loud uh, groups of people funded, backed by the U.S., who are always trying to go out into the streets and trigger something. They're just waiting for the right opportunity. There will be elections coming soon. Uh, the opposition party is backed by the U.S and they have openly and repeatedly talked about how they want to roll back relations with China and tilt back toward the United States and Europe, even though, realistically, for what purpose? It makes absolutely no sense. For example, Thailand is right now with China building uh, a, a high-speed rail link uh, to connect to Laos, which already has an operating high-speed rail link, and the opposition wants to cancel that and replace it with the Hyperloop, which doesn't even exist. And this shows you how irrational, um, first of all, the proxies the U.S. picks uh, to replace friendly uh, China-friendly governments in the region. And we have seen elsewhere, especially in Europe, I mean, look at all of Europe, what is happening to them. The decisions that they are making are not in their best interests. They're in the best interests of the U.S. And it's it's tensions that it has with Russia. This is the exact same situation is unfolding here in Southeast Asia. They're trying to maneuver governments into power that will make these irrational decisions, hurting their country, hurting the region, but suiting Washington's interests of encircling and containing China. They cannot win over Southeast Asia and then turn Southeast Asia against China. They can destabilize and burn it down so that it does no good for China. They, it's one less group of countries that China can trade with and, and enjoy peace, stability, and prosperity together with. Mm -hmm. uh, can you also explain to the new viewers to this channel or to this live stream who haven't watched our previous interviews, uh, what the United States did through organizations like NED? Because many of the lies about China, either it's about the uh, relations between Chinese mainland or Taiwan Island or the uh, Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region uh, or its, it, its relations with the, or Hong Kong actually, Hong Kong ICR. So it's actually all funded and uh, through the organization like NED. So can you uh, explain to our viewers uh, who's behind all this? So, so many, many decades ago, the CIA would infiltrate a country look for disgruntled minority groups, uh, pour money and weapons into organizations they would help create and prop up, and they would do that to, to give them a disproportionate uh, amount of power in that society to divide, destroy, over, overthrow, and take over that, that country. And this is what they have been doing in China for decades and decades. There's US State Department documents that openly admit that they were backing Tibetan separatists uh, arming them, uh, sending them across the, the border to fight and, and kill Chinese people. Uh, they were doing the exact same thing with extremists in Xinjiang. They were radicalizing them, uh, encouraging them to, to organize and to carry out violence and to pursue separatism. And they were doing the exact same thing in Hong Kong. And there are differences because there are different groups of people in Hong Kong. They focused on, on young people, students, 
and uh, encouraging them to pursue independence, whatever that even means for, for Hong Kong, uh, which when you think about it, if they followed through with that, it would, would have been disastrous. The same goes for Taiwan, but that's the, the US and the NED, they don't care about that. Their, their goal is to divide and destroy China. When you divide and weaken a country, it's easier to conquer them. This is what the, the British Empire did for generations, and it's something the US just picked up and continued carrying on with. Uh, long, a long time ago, Western empires would use missionaries to, to do this. Uh, the modern day missionary are these fake NGOs funded by the US government through organizations like the National Endowment for Democracy. Democracy is just a smokescreen. They are pursuing this agenda behind. It really has, it's really the hijacking of self-determination because these opposition groups depend on the US. Nothing that they decide is being decided by the people in that country for their best interests. It's being decided by Washington and for Washington's best interests. Mm. What's very shocking to me is what they did did trying just in order to destabilize China or to, to stick it to China, they did horrible things in all these countries surrounding China, in Southeast Asia, in the Pacific. For example, in one of the previous interviews I did with the uh, low key, uh, local Okinawa, Okinawan, uh, he's, he's a native Okinawan, Rob Kajivara, and he's being advocated for making people to realize the horrendous crimes the United States and also the Japan government did to their people uh, because they are basically, they literally did a genocide to the locals. And uh, by building all these military bases in this tiny island, they polluted the water with toxics. And uh, imagine your city, your hometown is occupied by, by the, all these military, foreign military bases, and you cannot even walk through certain regions in your own city. And what's shocking is most people don't realize that. Uh, I have a viewer from a, a person who has been living in Okinawa, in Japan for 15 years. And he said, even though I've been living in Japan for 15 years, it was the first time for him to realize, to know this history by watching uh, the interview on my channel. So it's very shocking, and also not to mention there are multiple islands being toxic, tox, uh, toxicated by all these uh, chemical weapons in this region. So it's shocking that in order to con contain this region or contain certain countries, they would rather to kill millions of innocent people. Uh, absolutely, when I was in the Marine Corps, I was primarily based in Okinawa. And I saw with my own eyes how the United States treated the local people, uh, you know, the official policy. And if you were caught going out in town and, and uh, assaulting or, or all, all kinds of other types of abuses, yes, you would get in trouble. But why were we there in the first place? It made no sense uh, to have a military base and then have a, a network of military bases covering the island of Okinawa. Uh, you, you, are, you are causing harm to that society by doing that. And then you have to ask yourself, why? why? Why were we there? There's no reason for us to be there. Japan isn't under any threat. It's so that the United States can project power into East Asia thousands and thousands of miles away from its own shores, across an entire ocean. There was no reason for us to be there. And you're talking about what the US has done in nations along the borders or, or in adjacent regions to China. Uh, the National Endowment for Democracy promotes separatism in places like Pakistan the southwest province of Baluchistan. They have an armed separatist movement there. Uh, the, their sole purpose, well, they're pursuing independence. But again, what would an independence Baluchistan look like? It would look like a failed uh, micro state. But in reality, the purpose is disrupting China's Belt and Road, which is passing through Baluchistan, the China-Pakistan economic corridor. These terrorists attack Chinese engineers, they attack the physical infrastructure, they attack the Pakistani security forces providing protection for the, the Chinese engineers, and they've even attempted to kill the Chinese ambassador himself. It's, it's outrageous. And when you think about what the US is doing there, how uh, in 20, uh, 2009 and 2010 here in Thailand, US sponsored agitators 
brought weapons into the streets in Bangkok, burned sections of the city down. There's already a war going on. It's just not a, a conventional war. It's not an overt war, but it is the United States through its proxies killing Chinese people, killing infrastructure that they've built up, and uh, destabilizing territory, countries, and regions all along China's periphery. So China very much is under siege. And then when China is talking about building up its military, it's in response to this. So uh, the, uh, the, the previous segment, you showed the, the map of Iran surrounded by US bases and how dare Iran put its country in the middle of all of these bases. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's funny, but it's also because the US accuses Iran of being an aggressor, when in reality, it's the US completely surrounding Iran with its military force, a force that has repeatedly been used to attack and destroy countries right on Iran's border, Iraq uh, to the west, Afghanistan to the east. It's, it's really unreal mm. how much power the Western media has to, to convince people that this is normal. Mm. Especially mentioned, and I showed the picture during the interview with uh, Jose Esquire, which just minutes ago, he is of Iraq descent. So he knows exactly what happened in his country. And uh, in previous interviews, he said, well, after 10 years, our country still has issues getting clean water, getting the basic needs like electricity. So his country is so devastated by all these foreign forces, all these invasions. So that's why he, part of the reason he's, he, 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 he's worked working to be advocate as for, for Belt and Road Initiative because he saw the potential that the project like this can bring to countries, countries like his. Uh, this can finally bring some important infrastructure for those countries to help those local people have a decent life. So, okay, I also prepared several uh, funny takes for you. So you have 10 seconds okay. to react to each of those funny takes. So let's take a look at the first okay. one. <laughs> yes, uh, the, the but at what cost? So no matter what China is doing, no matter how successfully they are doing it, it's always at what cost. So uh, these, these are ki the kind of people that you, we know in our personal life that no matter what happens, they try to find some negative aspect, no matter how far-fetched, to kind of uh, ruin the party, so to speak. And this is, this is what the West does because they're, they're jealous and they feel insecure, and so they have to attack absolutely everything China does that is positive. Mm. At what cost? This always makes me laugh. <laughs> this, 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 it's very easy to be a, a journalist for some Western mainstream media, just at a what cost. And you <laughs> Absolutely. <see. laughs> okay, the next one. Australia must ready Solomon Islands invasion to stop China's security deal. So, what do you say about yes. this? Uh, this is, again, this is an a absolute absurdity. Uh, the, so, Australia, uh, Australia is talking about uh, possibly invading the Solomon Islands or, or coercing the Solomon Islands because the West is talking about we need to advocate for peace and freedom, democracy, and human rights. But here's the Solomon Islands on their own as a process of self-determination. They want to deal with China. They want a security deal with China because Australia, the United States, and, and other Western powers have already deeply meddled in the Solomon Islands, caused violence, uh, attacked the capital with mobs that the, the US had sponsored. And that's why they want a security deal with China in the first place. So uh, again, it's, it's this massive hypocrisy and detachment from reality. They want to stabilize the world by, and, and promote freedom around the world by invading and crushing anyone who makes any decision on their own. <laughs> it's also very interesting because uh, right after Solomon Islands decided to work with China, and then the United States sent high uh, senior officials to this country they haven't done that since the World War II. And right after they decided to work with China, they sent senior officials fly to the nation to try to persuade them to not work with China. So it's very hilarious. <laughs> okay, the next one. The Economist comparing Chinese people with pigs. What do you say about this, yeah. Ryan? Uh, I, I find this actually... Um... This, this makes me uh, angriest of all, and this is something you see across the Western media and from Western political leaders. They, they are 
quite frankly, they are racist. And a lot of this is driven by racism. They see China on the rise and they see China about to surpass not just the United States, but the entire Western world. Uh, the Ch China has a population larger than the G7 combined. They are going to surpass the entire West. And these are people who believe in their own supremacy based, based on race, based on their history and their culture. And they cannot accept that a non-white nation is going to surpass them. So they do things like this all the time. It's about uh, one part because they're racist, another part to dehumanize the Chinese people, to make it easier to convince uh, people across the West to, to get on board with this aggression, with these conflicts, with the, the sanctions, with dismantling and destroying their society. Mm. Indeed. And uh, it's it, not just about China. Whenever it talks about uh, a country like the developing world or any nation in the global south, any nation that is not white, they tend to say horrible things about those people, like you are you are barbarian, uh, barbaric, and um, and uh, if you succeed, like China's economy is booming, they will try to credit that to them, like but it, yeah. it is with the help of Westerners or with the help of capitalism. So, yes, <laughs> you cannot or, win. Or or to or to say that China che is cheating; they're stealing all the intellectual property of the, the great uh, uh, white Americans because they couldn't think of it on their own. Uh, where are they stealing 5G from? Where, are they, where did they steal? Uh, they have the largest high-speed rail network on earth. Where did they steal that from? Or is, maybe that's why the US doesn't have any high-speed rail at all. China just physically picked it up and brought it over to China. <laughs> okay, let's take a look at the next one. Oh, Biden says Latin America's U.S. front yard, not backyard anymore. Uh, yes. Uh, okay, so yeah, so the, so think about it. The United States is, is claiming uh, Latin America is their backyard. Other nations, China, Russia, they're not even allowed to have normal relationships with these countries uh, because it's their sphere of influence. And then on the other hand, they're putting U.S. troops into Taiwan uh, territory that they themselves, under the One China policy, recognize as, as Chinese territory. Or the army bases, uh, marine bases, air bases, we were just talking about covering Okinawa, or uh, the freedom of navigation. I mean, the, the South High Sea, it even has the word China in the name of the sea. And yet the United States is deeply involved in that region. And, and it, it's much worse because they're militarizing China's periphery. China's just doing business in Latin America. Mm. Very interesting and uh, very interesting picture. And I think this also is similar to what we just talked about about the last picture, the attitude. Anytime they're talking about uh, developing nations, it's this, well, okay, um, you are our backyard. Uh, but uh, now we want to respect you and because we want to work with you and they will say oh no you're not our backyard you're a front yard but they didn't even even they want to be good even they want to be friendly they they are showing this racist attitude so it's uh, yes. really really hilarious I, th I think this is the last picture and uh, I actually got some comments from YouTube uh, to ask you I think um, Huang Tua I'm really not sure whether that's the way to pronounce your name. If I pronounced that wrong, I'm sorry, I apologize here. But uh, he's an avid fan for my channel and uh, very active during this live chat. He said, sorry, Brian, when I come to Thailand, I will shout you a meal of Pad Thai. It's <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> and also uh, this user from YouTube, Ater Car, US strategy is last man standing, or maybe we are falling in decadence. But if we are worse, we win. Is it, Brian? I, I think what they're trying to say is the, the mentality of the US or the Western leadership class versus uh, the, the rest of the world invested in multipolarism. The rest of the world wants a balance of power. They understand that there is no perfect ideology. The best 
the best way to manage the world is to balance power so that n no single nation can act with impunity, which makes so much sense. And I think everyone could agree that that is the best. The United States do does not believe in that. They believe in domination over the planet. They don't want to work among all other nations constructively. They want to dominate over all nations on Earth. It's not sustainable. It's not working. And we, we can see the results of the United States uh, exercising dominion over the world, how, how tragic that has been for the last several decades, and now how tragic it is as they, they cling to that as the world transforms and they refuse to accept this change. Mm. Thank you so much, Brian. Always uh, such a pleasure to talk uh, with you, to hear your perspectives. And uh, thank you so much for joining my very first live stream on my channel. And of course, after this live stream, I will add this live stream into a different separate videos and post it on my channel. Mm. Thank you so much for joining. And uh, tell all viewers where to find your work. Uh, you can find my work, uh, just search the new Atlas on YouTube and then look in the video description. There's all kinds of places to find and follow my work. I wanna thank you for having me on. I've always enjoyed coming on over the past year and I look forward to, to doing videos and maybe live streams together uh, throughout 2023. Happy New Year to you and to your audience. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, see you next time in more videos in 2023. Bye, Ryan. Bye. Hello, everybody. For those of you who just joined this live stream, you are watching the very first live stream and also the year-end special on Talk It Out with Li Jingjing, me. So as the name suggests, this is the my channel, my YouTube channel. So uh, I've been doing in-depth in uh, interviews in the past year, and I almost did like 50 different videos featuring guests from around the globe. So today in this year in a special, uh, we are uh, inviting several of those popular guests back to this show to share their perspectives. And uh, in the first hour, we already talked to Mr. Hossein Eskri, uh, who is based in Sweden, but uh, uh, he's a, of Iraq descent. So he shares how the Belt and Road Initiative will further connect the world in the future. And also, you just watched Brian Baletic, who is a geopolitical analyst based in Thailand, and also a former US Marine, to give us an uh, analysis of the future in Southeast Asia, this region. So this show will continue, so please do hit the like button, smash the like button. This will help us to get this live stream be promoted by the algorithm of YouTube. And leave your comments, we will try to read your comments. Uh, during this live chat, I have my computer right in front of me, so I I'm watching your comments uh, as I'm talking to the camera. And I've been reading all your comments on each of my videos, under each of my posts. So I always try to adjust my content, my videos, based on what you want to see. So later during this show, I would try to read some of the comments that I gathered in the past year. So do stay tuned. And now uh, I'm going to invite my next guest to this show. Uh, she is amazing, smart woman, uh, my fellow female fighter in this fight against um, these, how to say, anti-Chinese smear campaigns. So uh, she's the researcher with Tricontinental Institute for Social Research and also a member of the Dongsheng News. So Ting's check, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jingjing. Jing. What a pleasure to be back on your show. <laughs> Looking good, sister. I think we, we, we knew we, we were going to wear red, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so <coughs> uh, I think many of you already, already know Ting's check. You know what, Tings? Uh, the interview that we just did uh, discussing the COVID situation in China, I've received a lot of comments from the people from the Chinese diaspora community from around the world. Uh, I know I always have this Chinese diaspora followers as, as, uh, to my channel, but I think this video particularly got many comments from those people in those group. So, so the, the very, they feel related to your story, and they really want to know more about your story. 
So uh, how about you tell us more about yourself? Sure. I mean, I'm a Chinese person um, born in Hong Kong, but grew up in the West, in the great big free West. I grew up in Canada, but I've since kind of returned back to the global South, having spent some time in South Africa and Brazil and now live in Beijing. So uh, I would say I'm, I'm a Chinese person that only got to see um, mainland China in first hand and live here for the last three years during, a, I would say, a very interesting time. So maybe we'll get into some of those topics in the next little bit. Mm. So we've just, because Ting's is my really good, good friend, we talk a lot uh, in, in private that uh, this, we are facing a huge smear campaign or anti-China propaganda coming from the West. And uh, as people from this Chinese, grew up in Chinese culture and uh, seeing China, we, and especially facing this huge Western smear campaigns, we feel this huge pressure, like what can we do? And I'm particularly interested because I know why I'm doing this, because when I first wanted to work more on this channel, it's just to bring all the voices that people don't hear, either from China or other global South countries to the Western audience. But you, I'm wondering how come you decided to join this war, this very difficult war in challenging this Western narrative? How come you came to realize that's the mission that we really need to, need to do? I mean, I think first and foremost, I'm a socialist and I do believe in the project of socialism and the kind of long decades of construction that China has been part of. Um, in, in, in building this, and we've seen kind of incredible gains, whether economically, socially, uh, culturally, um, in, this, in this sort of multi-decade struggle. But at the same time, I think it's about accessing information. I mean, right now we're in a situation where uh, to understand anything about China is pretty much filtered through the lens of Western mainstream media. Uh, and it seems like, and I think one of the things we saw uh, with the recent change in the COVID policy, and really since Wuhan out, uh, outbreak uh, first happened at the end of 2019, it seems like it doesn't really matter what China does. Um, uh, when it starts, you know, imposing lockdowns because the virus is unknown uh, or the virus is deadly and there are no vaccines to protect the people, then they call it repression. Uh, when China tried to innovate new policies to combat and contain the virus, well, that's, you know, mass surveillance. Uh, when China tried to, let's say, I don't know, offer vaccines to other countries, particularly global south countries, okay, that's, you know, political vaccine diplomacy. Uh, when China tries to host, you know, the Winter Olympics in a safe way, that's dystopic. So it seems like there's no way of really winning. And, and part of it is also a personal way of wanting to understand China more for myself to get the facts and wade through the misinformation. And I think me and, uh, and you mentioned I'm part of Dongsheng as well as Tricontinental, but Dongsheng really came about in this moment of the outbreak of the, the pandemic and realizing that uh, people, especially people of the Global South, uh, need information about China. Uh, and so we're a group of researchers that kind of got together from around the world, uh, from South Africa to Zambia to Argentina to Brazil, and some people also based in China, just to get the facts. And I think. Uh, the work like you're, you're doing and the work that we're trying to do is just to get information. It's not even necessarily about defending China so much as getting something out there um, that is um, truthful, has facts to it, and is of interest to you know, the people of the world. Mm. So why do you think it's very important for the Global South to get the correct information from China? Why do you think, uh, what major events in China that you think are crucial for the rest of the world? Yeah, I mean, I think what your previous guest just said around, you know, media being a bit of a smokescreen, I think that's the reality we're living in. Um, there's a kind of um, almost like a distraction mechanism at best and, and much more insidious at worst in terms of undermining China and the Chinese people. Um, and oftentimes you don't actually get the content because it's almost Almost like, oh, look over there, there's a flying elephant. And, and the message is China is bad somehow. Um, but one of the most important events, having followed closely and living here over um, the last year, I would say is the uh, CPC National Congress, which is the twice a decade event uh, of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, and where it not only determines internally for the party and for the country where the direction is heading, but it has an impact um, for the world because they give a sense of how China sees itself 
of how it sees its development and in relation to the rest of the world. And I think one of the things that is really um, striking for me when I was following this closely, and you were there covering it on the ground, um, was this affirmation of socialism. You know, Marxism was said over 30 times. There was a consistent look at the people-centered nature of a socialist project. And I think second to that, and this is where it's important for uh, the Global South, is it um, put forward a question of a China model of modernization. And so this makes us ask, what kind of modernization and through what means? Well, it defines you know, what, you know, in the speech especially that uh, Xi Jinping gave from the 19th, the previous Congress, was looking at, okay, for a large society, for a, a large population, uh, questions of common prosperity, how do you balance sort of the material and the environmental and the cultural development of a country? How do you balance human and uh, uh, and nature? And how do you promote peace in your development? And But also what it talks about was what it is not. And in that, there was actually quite a strong condemnation of the path of Western capitalist modernization. Um, and one of the quotes that I really quite liked is saying that China is not treading the path, the old path of war, uh, colonization, and I think plunder taken uh, by some countries, some countries, um, that brutal and bloodstained path of enrichment at the expense of others and has caused great suffering to developing countries. And I think that's really strong. I mean, anyone from the global south, from the former colonized countries, still, there are still some colonies now, um, we know this bloodstained path all too well. And even after the process of liberating ourselves, you know, especially in Asian Africa in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, what were the options, the so-called options that the U.S.-led West offered? I mean, they were structural adjustment, privatization, neoliberal market policies, a so-called Washington consensus. So in a way, this, um, this, this path, this Western path, capitalist path modernization hasn't really brought much good to the people, the environment, and to our independent and sovereign development. So I think what China has been able to do for itself uh, not only, for example, lifting 850 million people out of poverty in the last four decades, be able to, you know, send a rover to Mars or go to the dark side of the moon or send a woman and do her first spacewalk. You know, these are incredible achievements socially, technologically, economically. But that it's also offering a possibility, not a model to be copied, but a possibility learnings that are useful for the rest of the developing world uh, that has yet to be able to find that independent um, uh, path of, of prosperity and also one that balances economic needs but also the needs of the people. Mm. You just brought up all those issues, all those stories that are very important to show the development of China but almost never been shown by all this Western mainstream media who show their enthusiasm on covering China. They send multiple correspondents based in China but now of this story is being shown by the media and in the party congress because I, I was covering the congress on the ground and then uh, when I see the results of all this Western media coverage, it's just so far from the truth. For example, several media outlets they will choose they would they would choose the several for example the when, when President Xi Jinping delivered the work report, uh, it's a, a almost two hours long work report and uh, go through every section, uh, review what China did in the past, and also look into the future, how we're going to develop in economy, in agriculture, in narrow the uh, income, in uh, unbalanced distribution, and just every aspect. And then the media, I think it was CNN, it just focused, oh, China vows to use violence to, to on, on Hong Kong, as they are on Taiwan. And I was like, did, did, did you hear the work report? Were you, were you there? Because the work report was almost two hours long. And he did mention about what are gonna, what are gonna, how China, China's mainland is going to reunite with Taiwan Island. It was through peaceful ways, but China will never abandon the means to, to, to use violence if there were foreign interferences or separatists. So. And, but that only happened like for several minutes in the entire work report. But they will you know, cherry pick several parts and they amplify it and twist it 
and to demonize the whole party Congress. And that's what worries me about this anti-China propaganda in the West, because uh, not only they are misguiding the people outside of China, to some extent, they also misguided Chinese people, those people, Chinese descendants, or Chinese diaspora across the world, when they constantly see their culture, their own country being portrayed like this on the Western atmosphere, some of them feel ashamed about their culture, ashamed about their country. And so that was what worries me because they got the young people, young Chinese diaspora, to doubt themselves, to doubt their roots. What's, what's your thought? I mean, it's absolutely. Information is everything. Um, uh, and if we have bad information, we make bad decisions, um, not only about having a bad conception of a place or a people. And I mean, I think sometimes, and even why we started Dongsheng, it wasn't about uh, being pro-China, uh, it wasn't about whether or not you like socialism or even believe that China is socialist or not. That's not necessarily the point. The point is, I think it does a great disservice to humanity um, if we shut off the possibility of learning, like, for example, the work report example, which is a great one you gave, uh, to learn from not only the second largest economy, but the largest, most populous country, well, now India is up there, of 1.4 billion people, but a very dynamic society, a civilization of 5,000 years. I mean, it's not exceptional, but it's a place that has uh, much to <coughs> offer, um, and it has a dynamism. Um, and yes, Chinese people are also dynamic because you know a lot of times the media seems to portray uh, all, uh, all of us as sort of one unthinking mass of people. But whether you're interested in science, you know, I mentioned some of the things, that, I mean, I'm a, a space nerd, so following just the space program that China has been able to do is fascinating. Um, whether you're interested in these sort of social questions like poverty or hunger, or the kind of big dilemmas that are facing humanity today, or you're interested in tech, you know, how did, I think one of your guests were talking about build, China build the most extensive high-speed railway in the world when, you know, 70 years ago it couldn't even uh, produce one car. Mm -hmm. uh, or environment, you know, the big climate questions of our time. How will China reach its transition to a carbon neutral uh, society by 2050? These are 2060. But these are fascinating questions and I want to just urge all of us, and I think your viewers are obviously going to be amenable to this, to be, stay open, stay curious, seek information. There is so much to be learned, and there's nothing that helps any of us to close the doors and focus on you know, two sentences in a work report in a week-long meeting that had so much content to offer. Mm. I know you did some field research uh, in some rural regions in China to understand how poverty alleviation was being implemented, how it was carried out, how China lifted those people out of absolute poverty. So can you share some of those stories? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that trip uh, that culminated into a study that we uh, published in Tricontinental Institute for Social Research, which is um, on the poverty campaign, was fundamental for my understanding. And, you know, as someone who didn't grow up inside the mainland, to see, go to the countryside, be able to, you know, more concretely understand, you know, sometimes not, we talk about China and these big numbers. It's hard to conceptualize. It's abstract. But when you go to the ground and you see in the countryside, you talk to women, youth, uh, peasants, you talk to the party um, cadre that have been sent far away uh, uh, to live and work with the families to lift them out of poverty and help themselves lift, uh, uh, get, ex exit poverty. You learn a lot. It's, it's quite impressive. So what we saw was the impressive capacity to mobilize a variety of sectors of society, whether it's the public sector, whether it's the private sector, uh, the people and uh, the peasants in the countryside, and to the party itself to be able to kind of lift this last 100 million people who were still living in extreme poverty uh, 10 years ago when Xi Jinping assumed his presidency. Um, so if anyone wants to check that out, that's on our website at the tricontinental.org. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, you know what? You, you, you said you didn't grow up in the mainland, in Chinese mainland, to see this. But you know what? I grew up in, the, in Chinese mainland, but still I didn't understand how, how difficult the job was to lift millions of people out of extreme poverty. And uh, just like you said, I always see poverty alleviation on the news, on textbooks, 
And by this year, we saw this number of people got lifted out of poverty. And before I w went to those regions, they were all just numbers to me. But it was until I went to those rural regions and see the living conditions of those people, how challenging it was for, uh, to help those people because some of them really in remote rural regions, for example, in Guangxi, there were mountainous regions. It was difficult to build any road in that region. But, and there were people, so those people were so isolated from the rest of China, the rest of the world actually. So to help those people get out of poverty, you, you really need to start building roads, building infrastructures, and start to provide education because without this uh, uh, being that remote and isolated from the rest of the world, um, you, really, you really need to start with the education, trying to change their mindset about almost everything. So it was a tremendous work done, and I saw those people's life being changed. That shocked me, changed me. So it, it, seeing with your own eyes, actually go to the place to see that for yourself, really help, help you to change your perception. So even as, as a Chinese, you know, I need to do this to really understand it. So, and to those people, to those Western, biased Westerners, you know, they didn't even want to make a little effort to really understand what's going on. So that, that's a shame, I gotta say. Yeah, absolutely. And I would say, I mean, in, especially in this COVID period, that sort of added to the existing crises that many countries are facing, especially in the global south. You know, we're seeing countries deepening their poverty for the first time in 25 years. We're seeing unemployment. Countries have exited the hunger map, like Brazil, and I know you'll have a guest later talking about Brazil, actually um, falling back into hunger. These are urgent questions of our times. And, and China might not have the solution or the model for all countries, but there are lessons to be learned because they're necessary for, for the world to know. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Tings. And also, I've prepared several bad China ticks for you. <laughs> so you have 10 seconds. I can't wait. <laughs> you have 10 seconds to give a comment to each of those ticks. Are you ready? <laughs> Very ready. Okay, let's take a look at the first one. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Sadly, you know, this is too true. Uh, and unfortunately for any of us who have to engage in the social media world, which is not really a real world, um, this is all too true, you know. I know, I know, you and I, we're both Chinese people who are just sheep that blindly follow the CBC, so we need this, this guy, this, this little <laughs> card there, to tell us how much uh, we are unfree. So thank you for your uh, noble work. <laughs> I know what I think. Uh, just just before the live stream, I showed you the the tweet from this uh, U.S. based China expert, senior fellow at a at an institute uh, on China, and he said it basically means knowing the Chinese language is not necessary to understand China. That's the attitude many of the so-called China watchers, China experts in the Western countries are. I mean, of course, knowing a language doesn't mean you can understand the country, or without knowing the, uh, the language, you still can understand some part of the, about this culture. But if you truly want a deep understanding about a culture, especially, especially if you are labeling yourself as the seer feller on a country, you need to understand the language. But they don't even want to put the effort. <laughs> Very condescending, racist attitude. Okay. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. The next one. The Schrodinger's China. I mean, I feel like this is almost, especially in this moment as China's you know, relaxing its COVID, uh, zero COVID policies, it kind of makes you feel like, wow, make up your mind already. Like, <laughs> I want to know when I wake up in the morning, am I living in a dystopia or not? Like, is it about to collapse or about to take over the world? Because it doesn't seem to make up its mind. Um, Am I free or am I not? You know, should we keep board clothes so that I can travel, or will you keep me from traveling to your country because I'm coming from China? It's really hard, but I'm waiting for them to make up their mind. <laughs> okay, very good. The next one. Uh oh. Oh, I like this one. This one hits home. Okay. You know, I guess 
Mm, where do I begin? I would just say, what kinds of freedoms and democracy did the Chinese people under 156 years of British colonialism really live, you know? And I think sometimes, and, and this angers me quite a lot, you know, since the handover in 1997, which is 25 years ago, you know, there was never, never such thing as sort of universal suffrage. There wasn't um, a... Uh, you know, the, 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 the democracy that is so preached and somehow uh, defended by the last governor, which is Chris Patton, who was one of the first people to come out and defend you know, Hong Kong's freedom today, even though you know, coincidentally or ironically, he was the, the last seat of the, the colonial power. Um, you know, from the beginning, uh, even the first legislative council was made. Uh, in Hong Kong under British rule, who could participate? It's the colonial landowners. It's not the Chinese people, the so-called Hong Kongers. So in a way, I think it's interesting now that they want to give us our freedoms, the freedoms that they never gave us over <laughs> 156 years. So thanks. A little bit late, but it's better late than ever. <laughs> okay. Uh, I like your rant. <laughs> Let's take a look at the next one. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, wow. Any, okay. okay. Wow. So I, I guess this is, it's, I want to say it's ridiculous, but at the same time, I actually think a lot of people believe that, and that's what's frightening. I mean, this is the kind of, I think, age old warmongering language that the US likes to, to use. The kind of, if you're not with us, then you're against us. And, mm -hmm. and I think there is, it's part of this provocation of war and creating the sentiment and the climate so that the people will support war. But I think on a serious note, I think especially for those who are Chinese, of Chinese descent, or even Asian, living in the United States, this kind of uh, xenophobia that's being actively promoted and acted upon is really dangerous. You know, And I think we are reverting to uh, a kind of anti-communist and anti-Chinese xenophobic language that has probably dissolved in the US but means, um, you know, seeing more attacks. It means uh, that more people's lives, especially who seem Chinese, are at risk. It means that they are more surveilled and, and kind of persecuted just by the virtue of what they look like. So I think it's a dangerous thing, even though this is actually not a joke. Mm. It is very dangerous. Like, you are either with us or with, uh, we, uh, against us, this attitude. Also this McCarthyism. So this it is this red scare, but I'm not in this like China scare. If you them to not criticize either China or someone or like socialist, then you are one of them and you will be demonized. That's very dangerous attitude. So Yeah, and I think mm -hmm. Jing Jing, I'm sorry, but both of us are really red, so I don't know if we have <laughs> much hope. We are the red scare. <laughs> You know what? Also, uh, made me because I'm very happy that uh, uh, I I have you, my fellow female Chinese woman, uh, join this fight against this anti-China narratives, and uh, because I think Chinese women or Asian women in general are one of those groups that are being demonized uh, the most in Western cultures. So it's important that we work together and uh, fight against this Western bias and uh, narratives. So it's okay to be proud to be a socialist. It's okay to be proud of our Chinese culture and Chinese roots. So it's very important to um, show all the Chinese diaspora uh, how important to get a real, uh, the correct perception of our own culture. So thank you so much, Tings, for joining me. Um, before I let you go, uh, tell us, tell our viewers where to find your work. Sure. I mean, you can find uh, the work of Dongsheng and, and Tricontinental on all the social media platforms. Dongsheng News and then Tricontinental. And then you can also follow me by searching Ting's Check. But thank you so much for having me. It was a real pleasure. And anytime, I'm happy to be part of the Red Scare with you. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, guys, you will see more of Ting's Check in 2023 on my channel. So if you like Ting's Check, Follow my channel, subscribe to my channel. <laughs> and thank you so much, Tings. Uh, looking forward to having more on this show. Bye. Bye-bye. 
so good to、uh, know there are、um, my fellow gal pals to fight against this Western anti-China narrative. Very happy to have this. And、uh, I've seen some comments from you guys. How about now I read some of the comments from you guys? I think this、uh, user was from YouTube. So that was a comment referring to the discussion that I had with Brian Belledic. We discussed the、um, horrendous crimes that the U.S. government and the Japan government did in Okinawa. So this person called John T. He said, "I was in Okinawa during my military experience. The locals were not happy with our presence and protested at the gates of the base regularly." That was in the early 1970s. So I think Zhang Ti、uh, used to serve in the military base in Okinawa, and、uh, he said the the protests were in in the 70s. But actually, the protests from the locals in Okinawa are, actually is on a daily basis. Every day they're protesting outside of the gates of the military bases because they don't want the military bases in their city, in their in their hometown. But you will never see those protests. You will never see the tragedy, the the struggles that local Okinawans going through on a daily basis, and especially those.、Um, not ne you never see that on Western mainstream media. That's a shame. And、um, let me get to see the no another one. This one's from Facebook. Mata Haiti. It is a good program, Jingjing. Jing. Please keep going. This. Program to open our eyes, what is actually happened behind our back. Thank you so much for supporting this live stream. So, guys, this is really the first time I try this live stream on my channel, and、uh, I'm trying to do something new. And also, if you like it, I will continue to do this live stream regularly in 2023. So, do let me know how do you feel about this program, and what kind of program, what kind of topics you want to see on my channel. Uh, leave a comments. Let me know because I've been reading your comments every day, and、uh, I already talked to three guests. I have two more guests that will join me in this live stream later. They are from Brazil and、uh, Africa. So how before I let them come come to the show? How about now we have a ten minutes break? So see you in ten minutes. People admire China. People are curious. People want to know about how China did this, because we remember, even if a lot of young Chinese people don't, what China was like 60 years ago, what China was like 100 years ago. But we have seen the transition, and we've seen that transition take place in a period where we have stagnated or even fallen behind. China has been moving up.、Okay. So. When you say to people that China is a socialist or communist country, it makes them sit up. Maybe this this communism thing is not so bad. It helps create a conversation. We are just beginning to learn the details of the process as it's obtained in China, and learning what variables there are that could be used in Africa. How does this work? In our part of the world, so the language is perhaps vilified. There is a certain、um, discomfort with the terms, but China's example is changing that. At the end of the day, <coughs> what matters is the material conditions of people. The living conditions matter. How can you 
people come and tell the Chinese people that their system is bad today, the system that has lifted them out of poverty over a historical shortest period possible, how can you tell them to hate themselves, to hate the effort, the, the products of their own efforts? For a long time, as Comrade Dupoka said, they were trying to attribute the Chinese success to capitalism. But the Chinese leaders and the Chinese people are saying we have developed because of socialism. That's what President Xi Jinping is telling the world, is telling us. That's what we are learning from them. I recognize, though, given the situation, I cannot deliver the mandate on which I was elected by the Conservative Party. I have therefore spoken to His Majesty the King to notify him that I am resigning as leader of the Conservative Party. You know, I mean, obviously, Liz Truss's tenure will be seen in Britain and globally, I think, as an utter failure. And it's, as you as you probably know, the shortest reign of any prime minister in British history, uh, just 44, 45 days. And really, it's indicative of a number of things. It's indicative of an overall crisis of British capitalism. And it's indicative of some of the very deep rooted problems in British democracy. You know, Britain is a country that sort of projects itself as the sort of the, the country that gets to define democracy as the birthplace of democracy, uh, as a country that has a democracy that's so good, that's so powerful, that it should spread that democracy around the world and that, that it should set itself up as the judge of other countries and their systems. Um, but Liz Truss was elected by 170,000 members of the Conservative Party. It's not a very democratic mandate for a country like Britain with 67 million people in it. You're talking about 0.2% of the population. I mean, we can compare it with the National Congress of the CPC, which is now taking place, where leaders are chosen by elected, re elected representatives of a party that's got 96 million members, which is over 500 times as many members as the Conservative Party. And, you know, who are these 170,000 people that got to vote for Liz Truss as Prime Minister? They are wealthy people, older people, and almost exclusively white people. And by no means is that kind of an accurate reflection of modern Britain, of the British population, and certainly not of the working class and ordinary people. You know, Liz Truss has continued this trajectory of outsourcing Britain's foreign policy to Washington, and it's had devastating consequences. And, you know, and people are angry, and she's had to stand down after just 44 days. A reminder of our headlines this hour, former president and leftist leader Lula da Silva has been declared the winner of a knife-edge presidential runoff election. With over 99% of ballots counted, he has taken 50.9% of the vote. Incumbent Jair Bolsonaro took 49.1%. Supporters of Lula da Silva are in the streets celebrating an extraordinary comeback for the man who previously served two terms as president. I know you guys are big supporters for Lula. You guys are both from the left. So I'm just wondering why you support Lula so much? What does Lula's win mean for Brazil and Latin America? O Lula vai encontrar um grande desafio. É, além de encontrar um país dividido, ele tem grandes tarefas pela frente. Ele vai precisar reposicionar o Brasil no cenário global. Ele vai precisar enfrentar a fome de 30 milhões de brasileiros, que é talvez a principal tarefa dele. Ele vai ter que pacificar o país. Né? Ele vai ter que conviver com uma frente ampla muito diversa, porque para realizar essa primeira tarefa de vitória, ele precisou criar uma frente ampla com pessoas da esquerda, da centro-esquerda, da centro-direita e da direita democrática. Então foi um grande arranjo político, uma grande construção política, tem até um, uma curiosidade. O vice-presidente do, do Lula, o vice, é, foi, já foi um um adversário político dele, que é o Geraldo Alckmin.
all countries should advocate peace, development, and cooperation. As the APEC 2022 chair, Thailand will hold the APEC CEO Summit ahead of the APEC Economic Leaders Meeting. As the first in-person CEO summit in three years since the start of the pandemic, the gathering aims to discuss solutions to the world's current and future challenges. APEC is taking place in, in Thailand this year, right now, this week. Why do you think alliances like APEC, uh, ASEAN, and all these Southeast Asian countries coming together is so important? Well, ASEAN is very important for Southeast Asia because these are all immediate neighbors. And then ASEAN's immediate neighbor to the north is China. And these are countries that have uh, ties and relations and trade that stretch back generations and generations, centuries and centuries. So it seems like a very natural progression socioeconomically and politically. All, all of these groups of people continuing to work together, trade, travel to one, one another's uh, nations, um, un increasing understanding among each other. And again, I, I have watched this region go from uh, a place that was heavily under Western influence to the waning Western imperialism that had been fading away from this region and it being replaced by actual genuine cooperation. Uh, as, as the Chinese government always says, win-win cooperation. I, I've watched it, I've watched it happen. I've watched one, one system fade and one replace it. And, and you can see the difference. This is a stark contrast. Hey, what's up guys? I'm back. Welcome back to this year earn special Talk It Out with Li Jingjing live from Beijing. I'm Li Jingjing. As the name of this channel suggests, yes, that's me, Li Jingjing. So welcome back. Um, I decided to do this year earn special, the very first live stream on my channel uh, as we are approaching the end of 2022. Uh, it will be a recap of all the major geopolitics in 2022. And also, we are trying to figure out where the world is heading in 2023. And uh, over the past year, I've talked to guests, uh, experts, and uh, researchers from around the world to discuss all these pressing, pressing issues facing us. And today, in this live stream, I'm inviting several of them back to the show to um, review 2022 and also looking into 2023. Uh, in the first hour, I talked to Hossein Asgri uh, to discuss the future of Belt and Road Initiative and also um, Brian Baletic, who is based in Thailand, to discuss the future of Southeast Asia, the tensions in Asia Pacific region, and also uh, Kings Chak, researcher for Tricontinental Institute for Social Research and Dongsheng News, to discuss the fight against a Western smear campaign against China. And now I have two more guests going to join me uh, later in this live stream. Uh, we will also explore the major, major geopolitics in Latin America and the Caribbean and also in Africa. So if you are watching this live stream, I'm sorry, I'm gonna remind you again to please keep the live chat going, hit the like button. If you are just joining, hit, hit the like button because this will help this video, this live stream be promoted by the algorithm. And because voices like mine, like my platform, and like my guests' voices are often being censored and shadow banned by these platforms. So it's very crucial for us uh, that you interact with this video and thank you for watching and I'm watching the live live chat on YouTube channel So I will read some of your comments and try to answer your questions So without further ado, let's invite my guests next. So 
my next guest. Her name is Mikaela Erskog, uh, a South Africa-based researcher. She's the editor and researcher with Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. Uh, she's also a member of the Pan-Africanism Today Secretariat and also part of the Coordinating Committee of the No Cold War, this international peace platform. So Mika, welcome to the show. Greetings. Very nice to be here. I'm super honored to be, I think, the only one who hasn't been on the show previously. Um, <laughs> so thank you very much for having me. But you know what? I always wanted to reach out to you, to invite you to, to share your views, because I know you had this show, The Korean uh, Africa China podcast. Did I get the name correct? Perfectly, yes. Uh, through uh, the Dongsheng Collective, the Dongsheng News Collective, which um, Tings is a, a senior editor in, we decided to create a podcast on Africa-China relationships because, as you know and as you've mentioned, there are so many people in the West world who are speaking on behalf of Africa. And when they are African speaking about the African situation, it's often people who, you know, are... Um, in NGOs, are well-paid government officials, mm -hmm. or are experts who are historically aligned with a Eurocentric view of the world. So for us, it was super important, myself and my co-host, Amadeus Musimali, who's a Zambian-based uh, researcher, we decided we have to talk about this China-Africa thing from a perspective of young African people who are politically interested in the advancement of our continent. Mm -hmm. You mentioned something very important because, uh, you know, Several media or Western governments, they love talking about Africa. They're always talking about Africa and uh, China-Africa relations, but rarely they talk to local Africans. How do they see, what's their world view? How do they see the relations between China and Africa? So, and also now, the, one of the most popular narrative they want to use is like, you know what, through the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, China is buying up the whole African continent. So, I mean, what's your view on this, uh, the uh, co cooperation between China and African nations? Sure. So, I mean, it's not, it's not without its um, areas of concern or, or, or aspects that we need to build up. We must keep in mind that, you know, we have a continent of over 1.4 billion people, you know, similar, I guess, to the size of the Chinese population. But we've been historically underdeveloped, you know, so we are lacking education, lacking access to basic, you know, material services. I think it's more than half of the African continent doesn't have access to water, doesn't have access to electricity. And so I will say that amongst the average African people, there is a bit of a, um, I think, a lack of sense of what the China-Africa relationship means in the bigger picture of what Africa's development means. Because historically, we've been pitted against foreigners. You know, I'm based in South Africa, although right now I'm in Mozambique. But historically, South Africa, for example, has always been very xenophobic, not only to other African um, countries and other African nationals, but of course to anyone who comes outside of the continent who isn't Western or European, because of course, ironically, be, due to the processes of colonization, we came to accept white Western um, interference or intervention or collaboration, although I wouldn't call it collaboration. And it created suspicion against other Africans or other nationals who are coming from the global South who might have an agenda that might actually serve our people. But so my point one is to say that the average African person has been so historically underdeveloped that there is a mixture of views around what the Africa-China relationship is. But as we've seen in recent um, studies and polls, whether it's Gallup or the Afrobarometer, I think it's 77% 70 of youth in Africa see their future as being tied to the Chinese people and the Chinese um, economic and political project. So I think more and more in the recent years, people have been looking at China more favorably because of the very clear material developments that China has offered in the last two decades. I mean, in the last two decades, China has come to the African continent and offered up, you know, of course, cheaper loans with the longer maturing periods infrastructural development, we've seen developments across, you know, multi-dimension of, of spectrums, whether it's tech, whether it's medicine, whether it's um, 
education, whether it's uh, telephones, you know, coming up with cheaper phones like the techno phones that also have certain features that are more favorable to Africans, such as having multiple SIM card inputs, because we often struggle with network connectivity and uh, prices. So a lot of Africans have will initially have two to three different cheap phones, but now they can have one phone that has multiple SIM card inputs, as well as introducing different African languages in terms of the keyboard. So there are a lot of material and very specific to African people's context that China has been able to offer in the last two decades that has gone basically uncomparable to other foreign relations, whether it be the US, whether it be Russia, whether it be Europe itself. And so, you know, right now we have seen a very clear leap and advancement in terms of how Africa is able to initiate its own self-development. And I think we're seeing more and more improved public relations, um, not only among state to state, but African people starting to see what China has to offer, especially since, um, was it December of 2020, with the um, China being able to achieve 800,000 people, uh, 800 million people, sorry, um, uh, being taken out of extreme poverty. And that's massive for, for a, a country that looks demographically or population-wise similar to the African continent. Mm -hmm. And also, um, I want to ask your opinion on this recent uh, the U.S.-Africa Leader Summit because just, uh, I think, on December the 13th to 15th, uh, 49 African leaders were invited to Washington, D.C. For, uh, for this uh, U.S.-Africa Leader Summit. And the, I'm reading through the documents on the U.S. government website because I'm trying to figure out the language they use. And because they, they, they said it's... it's they recognize that Africa is a key geopolitical player, so they are looking for deeper connections, cooperation with African nations, um, looking for mutual respects. Mm, so I'm, and I'm just wondering, how is this summit perceived by Af African people? I think there are a number of elements that we can touch on that speak to a couple of the issues that I think a lot of um, politicians, experts, anyone who follows these kinds of international relations would have found or would agree around is one is, you know, they speak about how they've they've pledging 55 billion and it's it seems like a big figure. It seems like, wow, this is a lot of money. But what we're not seeing is a lot of detail around where that money will go to, how it will be dispersed. And I, I know that one of the criticisms that has been made by various China Africa institutes has been around the fact that it doesn't seem like the plan is very specific, very goal oriented or very um, clear on what we call deliverables. And so that already is a red flag because many people, especially those of us who are like critics of capitalism, see these funds as largely earmarked for private firms. So basically it will form a role of subsidizing US multinationals in you know, the African continent and the projects that they're doing, but not necessarily channeling it directly to clear concrete projects. So that's one. Two is the fact that, all right, um, Africans have to be able to, and this is largely thanks to our growing relationship with China, is because of the rise of China and the US clearly scrambling to you know, re, re you know, configure its position in the African continent. It seems like a desperate one. You know, it said we're not dictating Africa's relationships, but every single coverage from Al Jazeera to the Voice of America have said this is a summit to recapture or you know regain the attentions of African leaders mm -hmm. in the face of rising China collaboration and trade. So one though is that. The rise of China has enabled us to push and leverage certain um, issues that have been put on the back burner, such as the fact that, yes, we'll accept the win, the small minor victory of the fact that the U.S. Um, came out and Biden came out supporting Afri the African Union's bid for a membership on the G20. You know, the European Un Union has a membership on the G20. Africa also wants to be a, a full member, as well as since 2005, Africa, since the Ezulwini consensus, has been, um, you know, basically uh, bidding for permanent seat on the United Nations Security Council. Keep in mind that 
African states and the United Nations, they represent about 28% of membership mm -hmm. of the, the, Afri um, the United Nations, and therefore are almost a third, yet they have no permanent security you know, position in the Security Council. And so now the Biden administration has said that they do support it. But of course, this is coming you know, decades too late. And I mean, even China in August, during the follow-up of the Forum on China-Africa um, Cooperation, Forum. They had a, a follow-up meeting in August, you know, basically to check that everything is going as was proposed. And then they already said that we should be having the G21 and endorsed Africa way before. So it almost seems like the U.S. is scrambling to catch up on this. And the last thing I'll mention about the summit that I think, or the two last things I'll mention about the summit, is that one, we also have seen, and this has been coming from former uh, government officials and diplomats such as, uh, I think it was on Al Jazeera, there was a former African Union diplomat, mm -hmm. I, I think she's from Zimbabwe, she was very outspoken about the fact that African leaders were not consulted prior to the US Africa Leaders Summit about what the, the agenda would be, what some of the outcomes should be. So there is this underlying, even though you'll see African heads of state smiling and nodding and taking photos <laughs> and whatnot, there is on the sidelines, I think, this perception that Africa is still treated as a junior partner in the international political landscape and that they are still consistently spoken to and treated in a very paternalistic and patronizing way. And there's this U.S. superiority, superiority complex that they simply don't deserve as, you know, Africa is this massive continent with so much economic potential, political potential. And we've seen now with the Ukraine war, the kind of role that Africa can play politically in terms of pushing its weight behind certain UN resolutions or not pushing its weight behind them. So it seems that also they, this summit was characterized by this continued superiority complex that African leaders and African people are just not buying anymore. And lastly is that in terms of the kind of pledges they made, you know, they made pledges, even though Joe Biden, you know, patronizingly told, I think it was five or six African countries who are going to have elections next year, make sure that you have free and fair and transparent elections and pledge, you know, some millions towards, you know, di you know, governance and, and, you know, electoral transparency. But what we didn't see is the U.S. responding to some of the very urgent crises, such as, for example, just one of them, is the debt crisis that's been happening on the African mm -hmm. continent. There are at least seven African countries who are considered in debt distress, and at least 16 who are, are at risk. And yet there was no significant engagement, despite the fact that most debt held by African states is owed to the wealthy bondholders in Western states, right, who are these are kind of debts that were brokered by the IMF, by the World Bank. And we've seen many, many studies despite, and I'm glad your guests already mentioned it in different ways so I don't have to go into detail, despite the fact that China is accused of you know, creating this debt trap diplomacy, but China only actually holds about 8% of sub-Saharan Africa's total public debt. And within the foreign, um, foreign issuers or external... Uh, actors, it's about 18% of the external actors. So China is still actually proportionally small in terms of the debt African countries and nations owe um, in terms of their public debts. And yet, even though the West holds most of it, the US leads a lot of these institutions, there was no mention in the summit of addressing the debt crisis, which that would have been, I think, something that they could have done even just off the tip of my nose, take a small little chunk, <laughs> do a little bit of debt forgiveness. I mean, China earlier, um, they forgave about, was it 20 something countries? They forgave their debt in August, which yeah. amounted to a, you know, a couple of significant billions. Mm -hmm. And so I think that this is also part of what Africans want to see from the US, but are not seeing. So there's this lack of sincerity behind what the U.S. is actually saying, and I'll wait until, you know, um, I'm told <laughs> otherwise, but we, I want, we want to see material differences. We want mm -hmm. to see material results of these so-called, you know, promises and proposals from the U.S. Mm. Even though on the official government documents, they never mentioned China or trying to say they are trying to compete with China uh, uh, through this uh, summit. But I think all the, uh, like you mentioned earlier, 
basically all the major media are interpreting this move as the U.S. the latest desperate move trying to compete the influence with China in the African continents. And uh, but like you said, it's it, it, it's very interesting that they didn't do the concrete things. And I think it's also interesting to see their their wordings because now on their documents they are. Uh, saying we, me, uh, you, the United States and African nations have shared priorities, we have shared interests, uh, we will work with uh, mutual respect. All these wordings are similar, you know, like what China, what, that's the reason why many developing countries w are willing to work with China because China was not in, uh, interfering their, their, their uh, domestic issues and also show mutual respects, but now, the United States and some Western governments never showed this mutual respect to countries in the global south. And now they're certainly changing their wording, their documents. I just think it's very hilarious. Um, and uh, do you think the United States has any chance to compete with the, the, the influence uh, 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 from China, Chinese companies in the in African continent? I mean, at this stage, I think there are three things we should consider is one that in the last 20 years where China has been building its economic relationship and political relationship with the African continent, where we've seen, for example, even as super, perhaps we can consider it superficial, but I think it's still very integral, the fact that since the 2014 first US-Africa summit, that was in 2014, we've seen an eight-year gap in terms of a serious diplomatic engagement with Africa. Whilst China, on the other hand, in the same space of time, has had at least, I think it's about eight forum on China-Africa or Africa-China um, cooperation forums or, or meetings. Mm -hmm. So we've seen this high level of diplomatic engagement where I think since between 2009 and 2018, there were about... 222 trips between China and Africa in terms of diplomacy. And we've seen consistently, I think since the, the 90s, that Africa has been China's you know, primary uh, priority each year, coming to the African continent as its first diplomatic visit every single year in the beginning of the year. And that's important. That shows a prioritization that I think Africa historically has not experienced from Western, U.S., European uh, so-called partners um, slash former colonizers. Then the second part is in the last 20 years, whilst China has been building these new relationships, economic, diplomatic, trade, uh, political, etc., what has been a contrast is that the U.S. has prioritized, clearly has prioritized a military buildup. So we saw the, f the formation of the U.S. Africa Command in 2007. Now we have around 29 foreign U.S. military permanent bases on the African continent with at least, you know, 60 access points or outposts that they can access in, uh, I think it's over 34 or so African countries. And so um, we see this prioritization of, you know, military presence on the African continent mm -hmm. that doesn't seem to reflect any of the kind of Res solutions to African problems or problems of the continent in terms of inequality of economic development. So there seems like the skewed priority, that's one. And two is that the skewed priority is clearly not based on trying to develop relationships with Africans autonomously, as you've mentioned, and um, I think this is important to understand then the US-Africa summit that just happened, is in August, we had Antony Blinken, the U.S. Secretary of State, launching the new strategy document, the U.S. strategy towards sub-Saharan Africa. And in it, they mention China and Russia combined at least 10 times. And they talk about them in terms of their near-peer rivalry. And there's very little mention of what does the African sovereignty project look like? What would it look like for us to independently engage the African continent to ensure that we can help them on their own terms, on, on our own terms, uplift the African continent? So we see this discrepancy around, you say that you want to talk to us on our own terms. You say we shouldn't choose. You say this is just about the US and Africa forming a stronger relationship. But clearly, it's all premised 
on a kind of great power competition and geopolitical competition and new Cold War essentially between Africa, I mean, between the US and, and China and Russia and other people who basically contend with the US's hegemonic, historical hegemonic position mm -hmm. on the international geopolitical stage. So for a lot of us, we see these recent moves as a slightly more subtle, but nonetheless a clear maneuver of the US to counter China and other groups. And we saw this by in April with the passing of, there was this overwhelming passing of a bill in the US House of Representatives, the counter malign Russian influence activities in Africa Act. And you know, this basically would penalize African nations who worked with specific you know, uh, Russian co co uh, corporations or multinationals. And again, this is clearly a subtle way of, again, maneuvering around the fact that, the, that Africa is finding alternative partners that the U.S. is not happy with. And if the U.S. is not happy with it, then, you know, we are not allowed to develop and advance the African continent independently. So this goes way back. All of these recent activities go way back in terms of the the U.S.'s aim to re, and I keep doing this movement, but this re like capturing of the African state mm -hmm. because China is surpassing them in almost any field of cooperation. And we saw uh, last year there was a 35% jump from the previous year in terms of the trade volume with China being at, I think it's 254 billion is the total Africa-China trade volume, whilst the U.S. is lagging behind around 64 billion or something like that. Mm. And uh, let's not forget the reports by, I think, the newspaper in Zimbabwe. Some uh, reporters find out that, uh, that the United States was sponsoring training local journalists to intentionally read bad reports on China's projects in Africa. So try and tra train uh, separatist groups, uh, certain groups, uh, independent, so-called independent uh, journalists to intentionally create some chaos in front of Chinese uh, companies and also defame the BRI. So you saw some chaos um, in the certain countries um, to, you know, the, this. So you know where the money goes. So they, they <laughs> They, they promise to, to, to invest this money uh, in African nations, but certain money goes to just not for development, not for infrastructure, but trying to badmouth another country. So, and also, it, it's, it's sometimes it's very worrying that when these Western countries, Western powers, when they go to this region at the Africa or Latin America, when they go to the developing world, they're not going there to help the local people. They are rather going there just to compete with another power. The intentions is different. So you go there not for mutual interest, not for mutual development, but rather just to keep another person, a third party, out. That man side is different. So, and sometimes it's not about what China wants, or it's not about what the United States wants. It's what. The African nations want is is kind of it's, it's about what kind of development the African people want, and the different mindset, I think, will be per perceived very differently uh, uh, by the African people about the roles of the Western powers. So, I think, and also, I think I got several reports uh, about what you just said, Vika. I think a lot of uh, uh, report uh, a lot of viewers are giving comments. Um, this is, uh, let, me, let me read a few to you. This, like, this person is called Josh on YouTube. He said, the U.S. is like a jealous ex. Once you move on to a new relationship, she wants, she wants you back. <laughs> this is <laughs> the viewer who is watching the live stream now giving this comment. Right, very, and uh, to the I mean, I totally agree. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah, continue. No, no, I totally agree. I mean, it's it's like basically that the you didn't look at my Instagram for a while, and now you see I'm in a new relationship, and now you're freaking out, and you're trying to double back and say, you know. So I, I totally agree with that comment. Uh, <laughs> and very, very clear. I got more comments, but you know, I also prepared this section for you. This uh, uh, funny takes. 
on Africa. So you have 10 seconds to give a comment to each of this take. So are you ready? Yes. OK, let's take a look at the first one. Mm, Kamala Harris, the Vice President of the United States. <laughs> uh, so true in terms of not what we can do for Africa, but with Africa. So Africa is always going to be like an arm of the body of the U.S. in terms of what the U.S. can achieve. And as long as it's expedient and um, it, within the interests of the U.S., then Africa is of interest. And we saw this with the way they were pushing for African leaders to uh, vote against uh, or to condemn Russia and Ukraine, as well as to sanction the Ukraine. But prior to that, they're not coming to Africa to talk to us about our various security issues, the various civil wars we are having in our continent, condemning some of the acts that are happening on the African continent go completely hidden all the time. So this is definitely the double standard of the US of we're with you only when it's at our own interests and in our own time, not on your own terms. <laughs> right. Oh, very good comments. And okay, let's take a look at the next one. So I don't know whether you know the, the, the story about this. <laughs> They're putting all African leaders into a bus to the Queen's uh, funeral. So what's your comment on this? I mean, I think this is also, regardless of the role that the West and the US has taken, our own African leaders continue to perpetuate and buy into, like, why did they go at all? <laughs> <laughs> they should just have not gone at all and said, you know, we are people from former colonies that have come as a result of this empire that the queen has led. And so why should we participate in bending the knee at her funeral to start off with? I'm sorry, that's my personal anti-imperialist <laughs> pan-Africanist perspective. <laughs> Thank you. I like your rant. <laughs> okay, let's take a look at the next one. That's what we discussed. So their narrative is... Uh, is China is buying the whole African continent. So what's your comment? I mean, I think it's, of course, it's, it's ridiculous and it's just not factually correct because a lot of the land and primary resources continue to be held by former colonial powers and companies that basically benefited from 200, 300 years of conquest, of subjugation. So. I think images like this are just not factual because if we actually, I think, A, put it correct in terms of where China exists, B, put it in contrast to US and European um, countries' financial investments and ownership of land, we'd see a totally different picture that was completely like disproportionate to what you're seeing right now. Mm. Very good answer. Thank you. And uh, do we have another picture? I think we do. Let's take, take a look at the next one. These countries aren't poor. These countries are rich. Only the people are poor. They are not underdeveloped. They are overexploited by the famous historian Michael Parenti. So uh, what's your thought on this, Mika? No, 100% is... I, I, I know it sounds, and honestly, like in Africa, a lot of people think it's very dull to talk about colonialism and imperialism, but the fact of the matter is, how can we say we've recovered from, again, centuries of purposeful underdevelopment, purposeful extraction of not only the material resources, but the human resources through the um, slave trade that basically enriched the West, enriched Europe, enriched uh, America, as well as it happened in Latin America, as you can see in Latin and Central America. So it's we don't have a lack of resources. We have cobalt, coltan. We have the most mineral resources of all the continents. We have the human capacity, but none of that is actually being able to serve people. And I think that's what the U.S. wants to continue with its recent um, developments. And I mean, I didn't get time to talk about this, but they quickly snuck in on a deal between Zambia and Congo, who were 
basically creating their own independent lithium battery manufacturing. And the U.S. quickly snuck in during this U.S.-Africa Leader Summit to basically come in the middle of this and control the supply chain when Africa was going to do it independently. And we've seen this time and time again from the U.S., whilst China offers different models that don't interfere and don't dictate on how Africa should develop its own economies and its own future. Mm. And I remember I watched this uh, talk uh, by... Uh, African researcher, uh, in the speech in front of all this Western audience, she said, how come your currency worth much more than our currency when you basically stole and shipped all our gold to your country? This is absolutely ri ridiculous. So, and it's, it's really, sometimes it really make me angry that um, they built their wealth by exploiting those, re those regions. And this, they don't even treat. They still don't even treat uh, people from those regions as as uh, like basic human beings. Sometimes they demonize not just people in Africa, in, they also people in Latin America and Asia. So it's something we need to work hard together to fight against. So very impressive discussion with you, Mika. I really enjoy this, and uh, I know my next. Next guest has been waiting online for a really long time, so <laughs> unfortunately, I have to. Sorry. <laughs> unfortunately, I have to say goodbye to you. But I'm looking forward to have you more on this show in 2023. Thank you so much, Mika. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for the show, and looking forward to next year. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, Mika. So, um, those who are still watching this uh, live stream with me, thank you so much, and. Uh, Keep the live chat going, and after this live stream, I will also edit all those uh, discussions into separate videos and post them on my channel on my different platforms. So I hope you like it. And my last but not least guest has been waiting for a very long time. Uh, he's from Brazil, and he will discuss all these major political changes in Latin America and the Caribbean. So his name is Marco Fernandez. He's the researcher with Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. So Marco, welcome. How are you? Are you tired for waiting so long? <laughs> no, I was enjoying so much the show. My God, <laughs> oh, having fun, no worries. <laughs> okay, so I know you're in Sao Paulo right now, right? In Brazil. So I know you uh, have some big events to attend. So tell us more about that. Well, first of all, let me apologize because I'm not wearing red. I'm saving my <laughs> red shirt to Lula's inauguration on Sunday. So, mm, okay, I can forgive that. But, but yes, <laughs> but yes, we we are super excited. Of course, this is like 48 hours more or less now for Lula's inauguration. This is a major political event in Brazil. I would say it's it's even i think more important than 20 years ago when lula was elected for the first time because now it's a different a very different situation we we lived like six years of a big nightmare being ruled by the right wing and extreme right wing the country is absolutely devastated it's more than 30 million people suffering with hunger now we i mean we never had this situation and more than 120 million people leave some sort of food insecurity right now. So, so first, like urgent task of Lula, of course, will be to tackle this issue of, again, poverty. And I would say Brazil should learn some of the lessons of the poverty aviation, the target poverty aviation campaign from, from China. Um, I'm, I'm sure they will. And, and the second big task, I would say, is to reindustrialize the country. Brazil had, in the last 20 years, um, a very bad performance in terms of manufacturing. Uh, just for one example, in 2000, the, the most, the key or the most exported product from Brazil was jets, jets, air jets, that uh, Embraer, this, the national, this, the SOE uh, Embraer, uh, used to uh, manufacture. Well, now we export soy. It's our main product. So this already shows you the regression of the uh, Brazilian economy. And I would say there's no other country 
in the world right now with more financial and technological capacity to support this urgent task of Brazil than China. Brazil needs transfer of technology in sectors like energy, like NEVs, 5Gs, biotechnology. For all of that, China could play a big role. And, and guess what? For instance, we're talking so much about, about the about the jealous ex-partner, right? <laughs> um, so imagine that uh, for Brazil, of course, I mean, as I was saying, um, transfer technology is a key issue for the, next, for the next decades. And guess what? The US Congress forbids US companies to transfer technology. So even if maybe the president of the United States trying to have like a friendly move to countries in the global south, US Congress would not allow. So, of course, I mean, this is one more reason why so many countries in the global south are doing agreements with China. I mean, your, uh, your um, inv uh, invitee, uh, uh, Mr. Hussein, just remind us of the great agreements that the Gulf countries, right, did with, with China recently in terms, for instance, of industrialization of the oil. Or, or space cooperation, these kind of things that not only Brazil, the whole Latin America needs that. Just give one example, for instance, um, Latin America has more than 90% of the global reserve of lithium. Mm. So imagine the, uh, the potential of a partnership with China to process this lithium in Latin America instead of just export uh, the, the raw material for, I mean, especially for China. So this is the kind of uh, uh, dialogue that Latin America, and, and going back to Brazil, that Brazil needs this higher level uh, discussion. And, and of course, I mean, the whole world is waiting for Lula and, and Xi's first meeting, which was already announced for the first quarter of the next year. So we're also very excited and I think the Chinese are also very excited. I mean, I don't know if you saw, but they, China is coming with 40 people delegation, including uh, the, the vice president uh, of China, uh, Wang Qisha. And, and you showed me the beautiful gift that China is bringing to President Lula. So that's going to be a, a very, I think that's going to be, it's a, uh, the potential of the partnership between Brazil and China is not only good for Brazil and China, is, is good for the whole global south. Remember mm -hmm. that Brazil and China were the key drivers of the formation of the BRICS in 2009, mm -hmm. especially a few years after the foundation when they decided to establish the new development bank in Shanghai and the, the, the BRICS bank, they call it BRICS bank, and the Contingent Reserves Agreement, which is a sort of alternative to the IMF uh, a fund. So. Yeah, I think there's, there's a big part. That's why I'm saving my red shirt to Sunday, <laughs> so I can both uh, pay our respect to Lula and the Chinese delegation in Brazil. <laughs> Understandable. Okay. Uh, um, you know, I think it sounds like you think the future for China-Brazil relations and China and Latin America relations um, in the future, not just in 2023, in the future has, uh, has, has been will be very promising. Do you think so? But uh, I know I, I, I've been reading the news, but there, there are some conflicts trying to create chaos for the inauguration in, for, for Lula in Brazil. So I'm wondering, do you think um, the future will be less turbulent, prosperous um, for the whole Latin America? Well, that's, a, I think, a billion dollar question because um, as we know, um, I mean, in many countries of, of Latin America, we suffer from, from chaos and political turbulences from time to time. And, and, and guess what? I mean, most of the times, of course, U.S. is involved. Like just now in Peru, um, we just had a, a coup against President Castillo, who was elected by the people. Uh, yeah, it was a very narrow victory, as most of the, uh, the elections. Actually, this is one of the trends in Latin America in the last years. Um, even when the left is, is winning again, it's a very narrow victory. Even Lula. Lula won by like one point something percent, uh, two million votes in, in more than 100 million. So, um, but, but President Castillo, for instance, now there's been already reports about the, uh, first of all, the influence of the U.S. ambassador, which, by the way, coincidentally is an ex-CIA agent. 
imagine the kind of mm. friendly uh, person. Um, but but guess what? Let, let me let me let me bring you back what uh, what Lula said. President Lula said last year actually when he gave an interview to Guancha. It was a very famous interview in China and also in Brazil. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want to quote a few lines from, the, from President Lula. This is actually the end of the interview. He's, he's, he said something like that. It's great to see China take a significant place in the world economy and to see China take a place in the world geopolitics. That's what I want for China. That's what I want for Brazil, for South Africa, Nigeria, Argentina, and Mexico. Latin America can be born poor, and it should not be natural that every time a country in Latin America starts to grow, there is a coup. And it's unacceptable that in every coup, people from United States and US ambassador would be involved. This is from President Lula, which by the way, spent two years in jail because of false accusations of corruption that are already uh, demonstrated by, by many documents how much US, the just, uh, Justice Department of US and the FBI were directly involved in, 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 the, in this conspiration to put Lula in jail. So he knows, he knows the, all the dangers that um, the extreme right wing will still represent in Brazil. I mean, guess where Bolsonaro is going tomorrow? Instead of being in the inauguration, he's not going to do the, the protocol and all the rituals, etc. He's flying uh, to spend a week in uh, Mar-a-Lago, in uh, Donald Trump's mansion. So this is, the, this is what our extreme right wing looks like. I mean, they don't even hide their um, uh, direct relations and, and with the United States and, and et cetera. So that's a big challenge for Lula, mm -hmm. for sure. You know, like uh, after our live stream entered to now, like three hours almost, we went through all the major geopolitics in Southeast Asia, in the Middle East, in Africa, and now Latin America. <laughs> we see some common elements in this. It's the U.S. interventions. All these uh, Western-sponsored coups, it takes place in every continent, in every region. It's... Why would Absolutely. you... Absolutely. I mean, yeah, yeah, you know, on. we have a joke in... We have a famous joke here in Latin America. You say, you know why it's impossible to have uh, to, um, to happen a coup, a coup d'etat in the United States? Because there's no U.S. embassy there. <laughs> so that's the reality of the Global South. We've been dealing with that in the last 100 years at least. Mm -hmm. um, but, but you know what? I mean, I think all your guests, all your guests made um, very, very accurate comments um, about the situation in their regions and how much, no matter what, U.S. It is, is losing some of, of its hegemony. Of course, they are still the big power. They are the empire. We cannot underestimate them. Um, but you know, we, we, should, we should remember uh, the classic book of, of Mao Zedong, The Protective War, which he wrote in the 30s about the, the war against uh, the aggression, the resistance of the Chinese people against the Japanese aggression, they said, you know, we cannot uh, underestimate our enemy, but we can also not overestimate our enemy. I think this is the situation we are now, and uh, by the way, it's interesting how much this book is, it's, it's again a bestseller in China in the last years, right? So I think shows all, I think is a, a bit of the, 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 the current uh, uh, political situation. But, but, but let me give you one example of this year since we're doing a recap of 2022. Remember what happened in the America summit? Mm -hmm. Remember what happened? Yeah. That, was, that was the biggest diplomatic failure of the United States <laughs> in the last decades in Latin America. They, well, they decided to uninvite Venezuela and Cuba and Nicaragua, which they consider are not democracy, so they should not be in, in the summit. But, but we saw a, like a major reaction. I would say even unexpected reaction, a reaction for most of us at the beginning. Um, countries led by Mexico, uh, President Lopez Obrador, and, and uh, also joined by Alberto Fernandez from Argentina, they led a boycott. And at the end of the day, 12 out of 30 Uh, five countries didn't show up. I mean, the presidents and even Argentina president, he went there 
just to criticize United States in, in the behalf of CELAC, because he's, he was representing CELAC. So I think this is a very good sign about the current political situation in the continent and how much m many of the countries in our uh, region, they are not going to just uh, um, uh, uh, put the heads down and, and, and be subservient to US uh, anymore. And, and I would say also right after um, that summit, uh, U.S. also suffered a huge blow in the region, which was the election in Colombia of President Gustavo Petro, which is the first time ever Colombia has a leftist president. And, and wow, by the way, Colombia, if there's one country which were really, was really the U.S. backyard, uh, was Colombia. <laughs> Colombia had, for instance, like has seven, seven U.S. military bases inside the country is extreme violent, violent country. For instance, two, more than 2,000 activists from, from social movements were murdered in the last six years. Mm -hmm. and, and, and of course, the relations with the United States, everybody in the region know how, how much uh, uh, Colombia government was like, like side by side with the US in many of the operations in the region. And Colombia is even like a, a special member or special partner of NATO in the region. So that, that gives you uh, a sign of what is the meaning of, of Colombia el electing now a, a leftist president? What is the meaning for the US? Mm -hmm. So we also expect that President Petro will be uh, joining hands with Mexico, Argentina, and now Lula and now Brazil uh, to reestablish CELAC, which were not um, sort of not meetings from 2019 to 2021, since actually Brazil left, since Bolsonaro left CELAC, but now CELAC is reconvening. And we expect from the next year mm -hmm. uh, that Brazil is, is going back. Uh, by the way, Brazil already already announced that it's going to reestablish UNASUR, which is the South American platform. And of course, Brazil is going back to BRICS at full steam uh, from, from next week. So uh, we're expecting a very exciting year, I, I would say, a, a very challenging year also for Latin America because of the, the global situation, the economic crisis, food and energy crisis. Of course, there's a big challenge for our governments to deal with uh, uh, poverty and, 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 and these issues for, for most of the population. But at the same time, uh, it's sort of like a window of opportunities being opened this year again, uh, especially with Lula being back to uh, uh, Brasilia, to the presence of the country. Mm. And you know what, I, to now, we have been doing this live stream for, for almost three hours now, and uh, we talk about all these major events in every continent. But you may think we are just here to <laughs> say good things about China, but actually, no. If you hear all these guests, um, what they are saying, it's not about what the United States wants. It's not about what China wants. It's about what people in this region want. It's about what the countries in the global south want. And like, just, just like you mentioned in, in, in about the Summit of Americas, like countries in Latin America, they are looking forward, they're looking for regional development. They're looking for independence without being dominated, being lectured by the United States. And the same for many countries in Africa, in Southeast Asia. So we are seeing this major geopolitical shifts, not, not necessarily because of China is rising, but because of every region is looking for a development, looking for independence. So they are looking for what's in the best interests for them. So they are tired of being told, being lectured, being bullied and dominated, and being exploited by the US-led West. And, uh, and they are working with China and the, they are choosing China probably because China is, is rising economically and also China doesn't interfere with uh, their internal affairs. China, the, uh, from the government, they are showing the respect to all these governments. Uh, regard, uh, they, they don't care what, what system you are or what's going on domestically, we'll work with you to look for mutual, re mutual interests. So I think that's important for guests from around the world to, to, to understand. It's like we're really, besides, apart, aside from this uh, so-called competition between China or United States, the major geopolitical shifts actually come from 
those people, the people in those regions, the global south, they want a change. They are looking for a new development method. They are looking for uh, independence. Um, what, what do you think? Do you agree with me, Marco? Yeah, absolutely. Let me let me give you one example um, about the relationship, the economic relationship between China and Latin America. I think the last twenty years they were outstanding in terms of uh, the the progress that were made. For instance, like the the trade between China and Latin America jumped from fifteen billion dollars in two thousand and one to four hundred and fifty one billion dollars in twenty twenty one. And, and uh, in terms of the, the, the balance trade, it is, it's very balanced, actually. China has a surplus of just uh, $6.5 billion. Um, China received 27% of the total of exportation from Latin America, and 22% of all the imports to Latin America came from China. And, and finally, in terms of inv direct investment, China uh, invested $158 billion dollars in Latin America from 2005 to 2020. So, I mean, there's no doubts about the importance of, of uh, the relationship between China and Latin America. But it's true that for the next, I would say for the next 20 years, we, as I was mentioning before, we need to enter a new stage. Because right now, most of course of this trade is Latin America exporting commodities to China, um, soy, iron ore, lithium, um, oil, beef. By the way, Brazil is biggest port of beef uh, to China. Is, by the way, is a very good beef. Um, but and and China, of course, exports manufacturing uh, manufactured products to Latin America. But the problem is that there's there's no there's no problem for Latin America to export natural resources to China because I mean China is responsible for almost thirty percent of the manufacturing uh, of the world. Of course, China needs uh, all these uh, natural resources. But for Latin America itself, it's for one side is good for the economy in general, but uh, the agribusiness sector, the mining sectors, they actually are usually they're hyper concentrated business. Uh, they don't create so many jobs relatively they have usually low salaries because it's like the low skill uh, uh, jobs. And, and most of the time is they create big problems for, for the environment. And this is, of course, this is the Latin America government's task uh, to deal with that and to control the damage. But as a whole, for the people of Latin America, only exportation of commodities, it's not the best deal uh, for a long term. So, so that's why uh, I was very interested on these, these last agreements with the uh, Gulf countries, as Mr. Hossein just mentioned, because I think this gives us uh, an example of what China is willing to do. Um, even like what they did with Argentina the last years, very good deals about energy, especially the one about nuclear energy, that China will not only fund a new nuclear power plant in Argentina, but will all also uh, transfer technology to Argentina. So that's the kind of deals that actually is expressed when President Xi Jinping wrote, um, read the, um, the report on the 20th National Congress, when he said that China is committed to narrow the gap between the development gap between South and North mm -hmm. of, of the world. So I think China is, is saying this officially, but is already showing, like in Argentina case, in the Gulf countries case, and other countries already, what China is willing to do. So also, it's our job as countries of the whole global south to propose better deals, better agreements with China. Of course, China is not going to do this for Brazil. I mean, Lula has to sit down with Xi Jinping and say, okay, comrade, we need a better deal. Can we do it? Let's do it. Let's work together. And, and, and I, it's clear that China is open uh, for these uh, new opportunities. Mm. Let's build, let's work together for a shared future. <laughs> so um, exactly. this live stream has been going on longer, much longer than I expected. And uh, so uh, very, even though I really enjoy talking, discuss this discussion with you, but uh, I think we have to move a little bit quicker. So I also prepared this, uh, you know, 
this funny takes on Latin America for you. So you have 10 seconds to give a comment to each of this take, okay? Let's take a look at Let's the first rent. one. <laughs> Let's run. <laughs> oh, this is from my tweet. Oh my God. <laughs> okay, okay, your comment. Well, this is the kind of things that um, the right wing in Latin America um, and the U.S. together uh, does for, for the region. I mean, imagine that this guy, it's, it's like a thug, <laughs> is being running around the world saying, I am the Venezuela president without being elected by anyone just because the U.S. now say so or the United um, European Union say so. It's so ridiculous. You know that there was a... Um, there was a joke when when um, Liz Truss, uh, she left cabinet with like, I don't know, 40 days or something like that. Mm -hmm. It was like a British record. Uh, the day after she left cabinet, there was a meme with the Guaidos, Juan Guaido. I mean, for the ones who know, this is Juan Guaido. Yeah. Uh, there was a meme Guaido saying, wow, I'm I'm applying to become next uh, a British prime minister. <laughs> <laughs> It's yeah. a joke. It's yeah. a joke. It's a total joke. So those of you who don't you know understand what? this, yeah. So this, you this know is. What? The situation is. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Cool. Yeah, just a little brief introduction. So to those of you who don't understand the background story about this, this the Juan Guaido, the uh, U.S. Uh, sponsored um, president of Venezuela, and the Economist uh, put him on his front cover, but he was beaten up by the locals. Now, uh, he's abandoned by the, uh, the, its sponsors. So, I mean, that's, is, that's what you see. The sponsors that the Western media portray as a hero are deeply hated by the local people. And, and, and it's so hypocritical because now that the U.S. needs oil, uh, more oil because of the, the, the crisis in Ukraine, um, I mean, they just said that, oh, we recognize that Maduro is the president of Venezuela again. <laughs> Because of course, now they need oil. So this is ridiculous. What a backstabbing at a Guaido. <laughs> okay, uh, let's take a look at the next one. Mm. Can you see the words clearly? Yeah. <laughs> My God. Yeah, I mean, how much? I mean, Haiti. It's we we actually Haiti is a tragic history because I mean Haiti is. Sub still today for the fact that Haiti was the first nation in the whole region uh, to become independent of European white um, um, colonization. In 1804, um, black people um, organized a revolt and just like expelled the French out of Haiti. And, and since then, Haiti is just being uh, massacred with like so many Oops and interventions, especially of course from the U.S. in the last, uh, and then they even don't know, and that that's the, yeah, the black people, right? I mean, mm. so it's a tragic, it's a tragic situation. Mm. I think it's one of the probably the most tragic situation historically in mm. our region of interventions from from France to U.S. Mm. Okay, uh, let's take a look at the next one. The Economist <laughs> again. Yeah, I mean, if this if this uh, cover were from 2016, they were right <laughs> because this is when President Dilma Rousseff was impeached mm -hmm. um, by a totally like a big fraud of the Congress. I mean, the Congress already recognized that she didn't. She officially recognized she didn't do anything wrong. Um, but that was again, that was, I would say from 2013 to 2016, that was the probably the most sophisticated hybrid war operation that US ever led was against Brazil. Mm. Um, since the, I mean, the uh, Snowden revelations, we know that President Dilma herself was, was hacked by US, mm -hmm. her cell phone, and uh, Petrobras, the state oil company, who actually was the, the center of the corruption scandals it was being heavily surveyed by by nsa and, and cia so um yeah how democracy decay we know mm -hmm. when when u.s starts to 
pull the strings in our countries. This is absolutely, uh, uh, it's a common sense for, mm. for most of the, the people in this region. Mm. Thank you so much. And uh, do we have another picture from Malko? Ah, the last one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Capitalism has never yeah. failed. Marco, what's your comment? Yeah, from time to time in, in, in Latin America, I mean, we have this, this narrative that, oh, okay, we, we need a shock of capitalism. We need a shock of liberalism in our countries uh, because, you know, the, the left spends too much. The left cares too much about the people and we have to care about the business and the capital, etc., etc. So this is a constant, unfortunately, this is a constant uh, struggle of our, of our country. But, but the one thing that I think is very important to remind, and I was reading some, um, some uh, analysis from, from Chinese think tanks uh, these last two days. Very good analysis, actually, very interesting analysis. But one thing is missing from some of them is the role of imperialism. Because they just, um, yeah, they just uh, assume that, oh, the, the, the right wing goes back uh, to power because the left doesn't really know how to uh, run the economy, which is totally false. I mean, Brazilian economy was doing very great before all the, uh, uh, this, this big conspiration against President Dilma started in, in 2013. Mm -hmm. um, and this happens to also to many other countries. Of course, I mean... They also make mistakes, absolutely. Um, but you cannot understand these ups and downs between left and right wing in Latin America mm -hmm. without the uh, major role of the U.S. Um, uh, colluding with, with the right wing in, in the countries and, mm -hmm. and, and operating coups, etc. So, yeah, this is unfortunately um, our history. But uh, we still have hope that we can change this one day and... Mm -hmm. And January 1st, next Monday, is the next chapter for Brazil. You know what? I got a comment uh, on the live chat on YouTube. I think one said, you got to love Marco's sense of humor while talking about such serious topics. Great guest. <laughs> and uh, there are several people very active during the live chat on, on YouTube. Um, Rudy Adrinson. I'm sorry if I your name wrong. I'm sorry. And Red Horizon. Harry C. Smith. And um, Ater Carr, Cosmo Ray, and Robert Richard, thank you all for being so active in the comment section. And thank you so much, Marco. You've been waiting um, online for so long and uh, spending so much time to give us this in depth analysis on Brazil and Latin America for so long. Thank you so much. Always a happy to have you on this show so looking forward to a bright future for latin america for brazil and also china brazil relations in 2023 so i'm gonna say goodbye to you now and see you more in 2023 thank you very much ninji it's a big pleasure to be here talking to you as always and well see you soon in in beijing in a few weeks i'm coming back <laughs> yes. soon okay bye marco bye bye Thank you so much for still staying with me on this uh, live stream. This is the first ever live stream I did on my channel. And this is much longer than I planned and than I expected. Um, but uh, that means all my guests have been so productive, giving in-depth in interviews and discussions on all these pressing issues we care about. So in the last section of the live stream, I want to give uh, my thank, my appreciation to you, my subscribers, my followers, my viewers, who have been supporting me um, in the past year, in 2022, because seeing your comments, I'm going through your comments under each of my videos, under each of my posts all the time. So I've been reading what you're saying what, uh, and what you want to see on my platform. So there are some, I'm going to read several of those uh, comments from you guys uh, that really touched me. So how about let's take a look at the first comment. So this is the comment left under the video I did with the Ting's check uh, discussing the recent COVID situation in China. So this person called Globe Harmony said, 
greatly appreciate both of your effort in clarifying China's situation that the West media continues to misinform on a daily basis for politics with their ulterior motive. And China has done a proud, uh, has done well, a proud country and a proud people that have achieved so much in such a short time. And happy new year here to you too, Globe Harmony. Uh, thank you so, for, so much for leaving this comment, for liking this video. And let's take a look at the next one. So, uh, you know, some of you may know that I was being featured and attacked by this US mainstream media Associated Press, AP. They wrote a story about me and you see they put my, my channel on, um, as they featured my YouTube channel in their article, uh, trying to discredit my voice, discredit my platform. So this, this, this girl, Nandini Dash, on Twitter left this comment said, um, thanks from the bottom of my heart for being a support for women, specifically East women to be themselves and prove to be worthy. You know what, when I start to make more videos on my channel, I never thought that I could inspire anyone. I was, I just wanted to present the facts and stories uh, from China, from the global south that uh, the West tend to neglect. And then this, this message, this comment shows me that, um, that it's really important to have female fighters like me and things uh, that we can prove to our Asian female fellas that we are very important and strong women that can achieve a lot in this world. Thank you so much, Nadine Desh. And the next one. This is uh, from Chris Freeman. Uh, he gave this comments on the video that he did uh, talk to two African leaders from Zambia and Ghana. And he said, I love this conversation and these gentlemen and absolutely correct. China gets a lot of respect from Africans and from Africans in the diaspora because China has always shown respect to us. We know who our friends are and China is setting an example that should be emulated. I will share this video with my friends. Thank you so much, Chris Freeman. Thank you much for leaving these comments. The next one, next comments. So this is under the video I did with the local Okinawan, um, Rob Kajivara, we exposed the crimes that the U.S. government, the Jap Japan government did in Okinawa. So Coach Richmond said, thanks for this eye opener. Keep up the good work. I've been living in mainland Japan for 16 years, and this is the first time for me to know this shocking history of o Okinawa. I'm originally from the Philippines, so I know what it's like for my country to be under the imperialist rule and the manipulation of the Americans. Now I'm also doing what I can do to expose them and make people aware of the truth in my own little way. So thank you so much, Coach Richmond. So message like this also made me realize that I'm, it's very worthy that I'm doing this job and uh, talk, bring those voices, bring those guests to my platforms because their stories are so neglected by the mainstream media. They went through so much tragedy and so much pain, yet this media never portrayed the, their stories. So thank you, Coach Richmond, for giving these comments. Uh, let's take a look at the next one. I posted a picture of me covering the 20th Party Congress, and I took this selfie with uh, all the female delegations to the Party Congress. They come from different ethnic groups, all the female delegations made great contributions to the country. And this person called Fabulous Pineapples 47 from Reddit left this message. Thanks for the coverage, Jingjing. I always like learning more about China and its people from you. 2,296 delegates, wow. I can't imagine how they find the time to see everyone and keep the event organized and running smoothly. Please keep the vlogs coming. I definitely will. <laughs> Next one. This is uh, Huang Tua. I think uh, he was also very active in the lab chat during this live stream. He left this message. Thank you uh, for this discussion with Hossein Eskri. It's very illuminating, even though I knew that that trap is a figment of the imagination of the heinous 
and racist to the West in trying to smear and defame the good effort of China in building bridges and roads to foster friendship, peace, and most of all the economic development of all countries across the universe. Keep it up, China, from a Chinese diaspora in Southeast Asia. Thank you so much, Huang Tua. Thank you so much for this message. Okay, hey, next one. This is from James Watson. Left this uh, comment under the video. I discussed the what the U.S. was trying to do in Taiwan Island uh, after Nancy Pelosi's visit. I talked to Brian Baladic and also Zhong Xiangyu uh, uh, from Taiwan Island. So he said, it's so important to see this sort of information. Facts are so important when trying to defend one's case. I've tried to explain to people that Taiwan is not a country. And this video really helps me to defend. So thank you. So thanks to know that uh, my video is, has some values and, um, to you. And for any of you who want to defend um, these cases like this, thanks so much. I think this is the last one. You know what? Even though I only got these uh, comments to show on the screen during this live stream, I know I've got hundreds of thousands of comments from several of my avid fans and subscribers. And thank you so much for your support, um, not just supporting my video and supporting me when I was being attacked by these several Western mainstream media. And it was your message that drove me continue to produce more videos on these platforms. It is your comment that made me realize, well, my tiny effort uh, in, this, uh, in this Western, major Western platforms are so important. So I will continue to make more videos on my platforms. Uh, if you like this live stream, uh, if you like this format, I will continue, I will try to do more live streams uh, in 2023, try to make this live stream a fixed program on my channel. So do stay tuned with my channel, subscribe to my channel, uh, stay alerted to my updated videos. And after this live stream, I'll, I will also publish all those segments with each guest uh, on my channel. So thank you so much. Uh, please do stay tuned with my channel. This is Talk It Out with Li Jingjing, live from Beijing. And uh, I hope you enjoyed your 2022. And let's look forward to a bright, united, and harmonious 2023. See you the next time. Bye.